Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, I am joined by very distinguished guests. We have PL, Bryce and Angie. We have an international cast here with us today because we're going to be talking about the Malazan Book of the Fallen. In particular, I think we'll, we'll just keep this to Gardens of the Moon, uh, the first book of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. So, Angie, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Like I said, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, in fact, I'm here to listen and learn, mostly. <laughs> oh, because, that, that's not uh, going to happen. We're going to make you talk. <laughs> I remember students like you in the past. Oh, I'm just, I'm just here to learn. You're like, no, 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 no. You're going to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully I will. Um, yeah, I can contribute something. Let's see. But I'm so excited to, uh, to be here. And uh, what else? I have a small booktube channel. Uh, on, of my own, a and the alcoholic. So yeah, that's about me. And and Bryce, how are you doing today? I am doing so well. This has just been so much fun. Just I've been anticipating this. These are just all people that I've just I, I've been fans of all of you for so long. And just, I know AP, like, I remember seeing your name in the dedication to not this book, but uh, one of the ice books, one of the, the Mr. Esselmont's books. And, and before I even saw your channel and just like going, man, this AP character, interesting. You gotta, you know, you gotta <laughs> nod here. You must, you must, you know, know some things. And uh, just, I'm a huge fan. I started uh, for this, I started my third reread of, uh, well, I guess wow. third read of Gardens and only got like another quarter this time but uh just in prep for this but i just i love the series i'm a huge fan and also just wanted to be part of of this talking about it i just love it so anyway thank you so much for having me and and pl good to see you again how are you doing thank you so much ap i'm doing well uh i'm pl stewart as you know i am fans of all of your channels uh price ap and angie and i am here today as uh, just a reader, not so much as an author, although I am one, uh, because I was showing up on AP's channel. I dispensed with my nominal uh, gear that you normally see me wear with the hat and the t-shirt, and I had to, I had to look somewhat presentable. So, so I, 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 did, I, I got rid of that, and I, I, I actually put on a collared shirt. So, uh, but I'm so happy to be here. Uh, you know, hoping that between uh, AP Bryce and Angie, who are likely uh, certainly. Uh, more, more, uh, more knowledgeable Malazan than I am. That they can help unfog me with, um, you know, with uh, this masterpiece. I have read only the first book, but uh, you know, I hope to read more. And I'm hoping that by uh, immersion and from learning from the three of you, I can, uh, I'll feel more encouraged to continue with with the series, which I, I plan to. Okay. Well, one thing I'll say for for everyone. Um, who is watching i'll make sure to put links to where you can find my esteemed guests on on various youtube pages and uh, mm. those links will be in, in in the description so there obviously there are a bunch of things that i can say about gardens of the moon and have because there are more than a few videos of mine very specifically about it and so why don't why don't we start with angie what is the the sort of the thing that you wanted to talk about in relation to Gardens of the Moon or an aspect of it that you wanted to discuss more? So when I read, when I read Gardens of the Moon the first time, the first thing that struck me is that, or confused me is that these different group of characters, you have this Darujistan gang and then you have uh, a group of people uh, in pain and all that. So. How, where are their allegiances? I was so confused with, you know, who is for the empire, who is against the empire and all that. And I, it needed a lot of ba uh, background work, I think. And it really helped that I was part of this discord, uh, the unabridged burners, the Malazan group. So there uh, they provided me with, with this PDF that we can use, you know, to, to sort of understand and get your, sense of this world and that really helps me but I think I'm still confused <laughs> I'm still confused with where each of them or their loyalties lie because sometimes in the middle of the book sometimes it changes also I think so that was kind of confusing for me so yeah 
it would really help if APU can clear that up for me. <laughs> well, I think part, part of this has to do with our expectation when we read and read fantasy in particular, because mm. we, we have gotten very used to a particular t style of narrative. So if you think uh, Star Wars is a perfect example of this, the empire are the bad guys. You have, they are, the soldiers are called stormtroopers. They, they are literally, they look evil. They, their whole aesthetic is evil. We can visually recognize them as evil. They do evil things. That's clear cut. And then you have the good guys, the scrappy insurgency, the, the rough heroes. So you have Luke in the sort of the more threadbare farm boy sort of clothes. You have the scruffy wizard uh, in Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then you have the rogue with a heart of gold, Han Solo. And you can see all of these, what we would consider quite stereotypical or almost trope-like elements that we see in fantasy, that there's a nice, clear, even division. So you do not have to engage your brain. You don't have to think about it. You go, good guys versus bad guys. I'm with the scrappy underdogs because that's the story that's being told. Now, do you have the same element of who the good guys and the bad guys are when you are, say, uh, watching a modern film about aspects of, say, in the military? Because you'll have good guys in the military and you'll have bad guys in the military because if you're focused just on that one military unit so even though they all belong to the military they're all in the army there's some good guys there and some bad guys there and because it's not a straightforward morality good against evil it becomes much more nuanced much more complex so when you think of the focus of what gardens of the moon is doing is gardens of the moon telling you a story of good versus evil and it's, it's not, that's not the focus. There are elements of it, but that's not the focus. It's not about two sides going to war because from the very beginning, you're told that the empire, the Malazan empire, we see the Malazan empire doing bad things from the very beginning because uh, in the prologue, we have Malazan soldiers uh, having, putting down, killing and setting fire to mages in the mouse quarter of Malaz city. So the soldiers are killing Malazan citizens. That's the very first thing that we see soldiers doing. The thing that we then witness, which is the first thing described on scene that we see soldiers doing, is a Malazan soldier sees an old woman grabbing sorry by the hair and the Malazan soldier kills the old woman. And you go, there's the moral complexity. That soldier ostensibly was saving the young girl, but did it with a mailed fist and killed the old woman. So they're not good guys. They are soldiers. And mm. soldiers are quite often as good or as bad as the job that they are sent on. And then that's when we get into questions of perspective because we are with the Malazans outside Pale. And we go, oh, if the narrative perspective is with them and we're seeing how they are affected and we're feeling this emotion and sympathy because so many of them are dead, the narrative is extending the sympathy towards that narrative position. And it's making us identify with the Malazan side. But think for a second, what about the citizens of Peel? Are, are they evil? And we're told, no, they're, they're not evil. The Malazans are the conquering empire. The Malazans are the expanding empire. So you're feeling sympathy for the colonial oppressors. And then you're told that the reason the Moranth allied with the Malazans was because Peel was a trade rival and that Peel beat them in all of these trade things. And they had uh, constant border clashes and they were trade rivals. And so the Moranth get their R of blood, where as a reward for being part of this alliance and supplying the Malazans, after the battle, mm. they get to go into Peel and kill men, women, and children. And you go, hang on a sec. Are the Malazans the bad guys? And you realize you can be on the wrong side of a conflict and still be a good guy person or can you and that is a question that i think 
not only Gardens of the Moon asks, but also the entire series is asking us that this question about what it means to be good, what it means to be moral. How, how good are you? Is it a simple binary? You are good or you are evil. And what we realize is in some respects, someone can be very, very good. In other respects, they can be evil, but it's not a simple binary. And one of the things that we see again and again in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, especially, you know, talking about Gardens of the Moon, the shift of perspective, giving us the different view on any one particular thing. And this helps us, I think, and is a signal to the reader that it's not just a story that is being told to you a la Star Wars. This is a period of history that is happening in front of you. And you're getting insight into key decisions and key events and key moments. But that insight is just into the moment. And it's leaving it up to you, the reader, to evaluate whether or not these are the good guys or the bad guys, whether this is a good thing that they have done or a bad thing. And that for a genre that obviously I love, but for a genre that relies very heavily on stories being told, where the reader is pushed in a particular direction and it is laid out, these are the sides in this conflict. And so, we get very used to that style of storytelling. So when someone doesn't do that, it can frustrate our expectations because we keep expecting that. We keep expecting a, an aha moment. Oh, these are the good guys. This is the big bad guy. I know where it's all going now. And because that doesn't happen and we keep expecting it to happen, it keeps us on the back foot. We feel unsure. So instead of reading what is actually there, we keep looking for things that are not there. We, we're looking, where, where is this signal to me? Where, where is the information that I need to decide this? So instead of looking at what is actually being described and paying attention to that, it's constantly keeping like an eye out for this other thing that is never going to show up because it's not that type of narrative. It's not there, yeah. What? And I even find, I mean, and that's what you're going into is, and even the more you get into the personal, the characters, you know, you're rooting for Ganos mm -hmm. parent, right? Mm -hmm. You're rooting uh, for some of these Tattersail. You're on, you you know, you're with her. And then you're you're seeing this own, this, this, <laughs> this, this empire going against even their own people. And you're, then you start rooting for, okay, so now I'm for some people in the Malazan. <laughs> And, like, but also, wait, what if, <laughs> yeah, you're all over the place as far as yeah. who you're rooting for, but I think that is the beauty of it. it anyway, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt too much. I just was like, man, it's so, it's just so many, uh, it just pulls you every different direction. Yeah, because the, the, the character of Tattersail, I think, is a brilliant example of this. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we meet Tattersail, and obviously everyone around her is dead, and she is, basically the opposite of the stereotypical willowy sorceress. She's a powerful sorceress, but she is a big lady, but she's attractive, she's powerful, she's self-confident, and she's surrounded by dead bodies. And someone who's half dead, literally. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have Tattersail, and we, we feel her loss uh, because we, we, that's when we meet her on that moment uh, on the hill. And then we get that flashback to her getting out of bed with Calot and the, the build up to what we now know is coming because this is a flashback. We know where this is going. We know what's going to happen in the battle. And we identify with her and we feel sympathy because we see her in that moment of trauma. We see the loss that she has suffered. We are with her perspective and that allows us to connect to her and then contrast that with how Lorne describes her and sees her in the dinner sequence. Yeah. And suddenly, because we're given Lorne's perspective, Tattersail is no longer the, the beautiful, wonderful, powerful woman that we've been admiring. She's now this evil sorceress who killed all of these people. And then um, Lorne's family imprisoned 
because of trying to stand up for what was right. And Tattersail laughed and didn't care. And Tattersail is now the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> and what do we see as Tattersail's reaction? She goes, well, okay, well, challenge me to a duel. And everyone's yeah. going, oh, but Lauren has an Atateral sword. Your magic's going to be useless. And then they see that Tattersail knows this. And we, we then get that complicated picture that good people can do bad things. Bad people can do good things. There, it's, not, it's not a simplistic binary. And I think Tattersail is, is that in microcosm for the, the bigger picture that we're looking at, that who Tattersail is, is going to be dependent on who is doing the perceiving. And we as reader, we get certain points of view. But what Erickson does, uh, perhaps to an extreme in this novel, is in presenting one point of view, is assuming that the reader will think about it from a different point of view. And I think later on in the series, Erickson eases up on that as a technique to give you slightly more guidance. But in this, it's very much, here's a picture of this person expecting you to realize that it is unreliable and not necessarily trustworthy information. And it is being shaped by the perceiver. And you have to understand who is doing the perceiving in order to understand how they feel about what they are, what they are looking at. And it's a very complex, well, in, on the one hand, it's a very straightforward technique, but it, it's a, a complex thought process. And it occurs a lot in short story writing where you are being asked to understand subtext from certain linguistic clues in the text. And if you are not practiced at that style of reading, because it has nothing to do with intelligence. This is nothing to do with, oh, I'm not smart enough to get it. It is a technique that is very common in a particular form of writing. And if you're familiar with that, then you will be very familiar with the technique here. And it's almost as if the text becomes a lot clearer because you recognize what is done and you can see those linguistic tells that are uh, telling you, informing you, no, this character is biased. So that the, how they are describing this, you're meant to distrust that or invert it to get another view of the character. So I think that, that we can see very particularly with Tattersail. Well, and that's a, that's a good point. It's, it, and that's what I always tell people is you have to, you almost have to like, it takes a little bit to be able to learn to read Malazan and learn to read this because I, I just feel like, you know, we're, at least for me as an epic fantasy fan, I was going from these massive tomes <laughs> to this series, you know, Wheel of Time and, and what, a, you yeah. know, you name it, and, and A Song of Ice and Fire, and you're just used to that one way. And I guess Song of, Song of Ice and Fire has its, its, its mode of doing that as well, the same type of, of things as, as, as Erickson has done here. But it is that you're just not used to, to, to spotting that, you know, that is the different perspective. So you're almost like, wait, is this the same person? So you almost have to go back to the dramatist persona and go, all right, okay, so this is the, that is the person in the, <laughs> in the, the mage, you know, the cadre. And okay, the, and that like the, for me, and so it took me a bit to, you know, almost just, just trust the process and, and see it from, it took me maybe books to kind of go, oh, mm -hmm. this is what we're doing here. You're getting that different perspective from other people. I did not get that right away. But I mean, it's, it's bizarre because we, we're so used to doing it in real life. Like we, we do this all the time in real life that we pick up on cues. So for instance, PL, I'm going to say something to Bryce here. And I want you to explain what is what I am saying, what I actually mean. Bryce, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> no, PL, you've just heard me say to Bryce, it's, it's not you, it's me. So who am I saying is at fault? You're really saying it's Bryce. However, you're giving him the impression that it's you. You're trying to but make I it said it, it wasn't Bryce. I said it was me. <laughs> yeah. it, it's a classical breakup uh, line. Yeah. Right? 
And that's that's because we're in real life. We have lots of things that we understand through tone, context, um, the, the situation that is going on. We understand that sometimes when people say things, they mean the exact opposite. Even if they say things and it, it seems very genuine, you know they are actually thinking the exact opposite. So you took something you, that I said and inverted it entirely, even though it was, you know, I was being sincere. It wasn't Bryce. It was me. And, <laughs> but we do that. I'm offended time. now, though. Well, you should be. It was definitely you. Um, <laughs> But when it comes to when it comes to text, particularly in fantasy writing, we we sometimes turn off that bit of our brain because we're not expecting to have to use it. So when we see things, if someone in a book is you know, and I use the, the very classic, it's not you, it's me. But if that happened in the book, you'd read that. And the chances are some people would read that and go, why is the other person acting offended? The, the first person said it wasn't their fault because that is the surface level information. And really with a lot of writing, the surface level information is only ever the first part. And there's a whole host of meaning underneath it. And that's why we, we talk about subtext. That's why we talk about connotations. We talk about this. It's not that it is unwritten information, it is not spelled out in a surface level, but it is implied. And Hemingway talked about this in terms of his storytelling technique, which was you sketch the top of the iceberg, you give the reader the top of the iceberg. And from that, they infer how deep the iceberg goes. And so the writer only ever draws in the top of the iceberg above the water, and they are implying all of this that exists below it. And that's what the reader is imagining. The reader imagines the whole iceberg, even though the author has only given them the top part. And that's what gives English teachers work, right? <laughs> God, see if I hear one more person complaining, you using that facetious example about, oh, sometimes the curtains are just blue. Yeah, like, I am going to poke in. It's funny because, um, you know, for me, um, and, and Bryce raised an excellent point, you know, for those of us, those of us that believe we're all fans somewhat of either A Song of Ice and Fire, the series, or uh, Game of Thrones, the TV show, to a certain extent, barring the last few seasons, the, the one thing that, uh, for those of us who saw um, this series, uh, is particularly uh, that Field of Fire um, uh, episode, that you feel like you don't want anyone to die, which is impossible because you're all you're dealing with characters that are are all on different sides and they have competing interests. But but so many of us loved all of those characters. You you know you you don't want Daenerys to die. You don't want Jamie to die. You don't want this the, the rogue Brown to die. You don't want you know. Uh, so it, it it's it's it. I, I think that technique that AP was talking about. Yeah, I, I did pick up that Erickson was doing that very, very well. And, and, and I love that element of his books. Uh, for me, I think, and, and here it's where, you know, you, for me, it was, it was a tough comeuppance because I considered myself, of course, as we all do, someone who doesn't really have an ego, but, you know, that to that degree. But of course, I was, I felt very humiliated that a writer, an author like myself that, you know, prides himself in, in writing somewhat immersive fantasy with, the world building was it was it getting things about this 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 incredibly deep and immersive world and for me it wasn't so much uh the the, the plots and i i got that figured out who was who and you know i i clung on to my favorite characters with for dear life i clung on to the parents i clung on to the tower sales I, I clung on to rake right and to crone and i and wow. i and i I think that really helped me with the actual plot and the narrative and, and, and how things were, were flowing. But for me, it was all about making a choice about how much of the, the backstory specifically, the immersive backstory, which already in the first book, you're, 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 you're interested in things that are, are thousands of years before, right? And, and, and to a degree that I won't say it's saturated the narrative for me, but for me, it was, it was, it was, it was overwhelming to what extent that was done. It was brilliantly done, but I was trying to pick apart 
okay, how much of this element of the history of this world that Ericus has created do I have, do I need to think about no process that's relevant to the moment? And how much of it do I just enjoy and just, you know what, that's great stuff and just keep reading. And, and that was for me, I think the biggest challenge, the, the backstory and history and the level of backstory and history, right? That didn't seem to directly relate to as many characters and as many plot lines as I would have thought for, you know, a fancy book. And again, thinking, okay, perhaps these will be very, very relevant later as this long series progresses. But right now, how much of this do I need to know and understand that is relevant to this book and that I guess potentially could be relevant later? That I think was my biggest, biggest struggle with, with Mao Zedong. And, you know, that's that's a really interesting point, because obviously very infamously, Ericsson uh, wrote Gardens of the Moon in Media Res. Like it starts in the middle of an ongoing story. So uh, have you seen the film Saving Private Ryan? One of right. my favorite films. Yeah. So how much of World War II is explained to you before we see the beach landing? You go, none of it. Yeah. It is just assumed that the viewer will understand what World War II is. Because we get the Normandy beach landing, they run up and then it's, oh, you've been sent on this mission to go and get yeah. Private Ryan. Okay. But who are the bad guys? What's going on? What, what, what side's this? You, none of that is ever explained to the reader, but we don't have a problem with it because, oh, well, everyone knows about World War II. You know, but that's, that's exactly the same technique. It is an assumption that the viewer or the reader understands what this stuff is. So when one of the characters uh, has the Star of David instead of a, a crucifix. You don't suddenly have a big chunk of exposition of someone explaining what Judaism is and how important that is in a narrative about World War II and the Nazis. You don't have someone explaining that. It's put in there. Um, and someone else having a crucifix. You know, oh, let's, let's now all divert from the film for a second and we're going to give you a 15-minute 15, uh, 15 minute segment on what the different religions are and how they evolved over time in this world. No, it's added in as context and it is important for the story. It is important for the narrative, but it is not important to explain to the viewer, to the reader. And more knowledge about those things adds additional resonance. But this is, I would say, very much similar to in Gardens of the Moon. Yes, there is an entire history. Yes, there is all of this complication and depth to the world. But knowing that will only add to the richness as opposed to is necessary to understand what is going on. Because what is going on is very, very clear. The Malazan soldiers have conquered Pale. Darugistan is next on the list. They are going to conquer Darugistan. The people in Darugistan are going, we don't want to be conquered. And we get a point of view from Darugistan. And in this, we have a plan because we've seen this, the Dark Lord of Moonspawn, the Chaos Man, Anamander Rake, is an uber powerful sorcerer. How are they going to deal with them? Lorne has this plan to release an ancient, undead, magical monster. Does it matter that you don't know what a jagged is? I'm sorry, do you know what a Balrog is when you first read The Lord of the mm -hmm. Rings? No, you, you get, oh, the Balrog, one of the the servants of the ancient fire, blah, blah, blah. You, know, it's, you can go and read the Silmarillion and find out, but you don't have that knowledge of what a Balrog is when they're, oh, they have a cave troll. So cave trolls of the genus Trolli, and uh, they're very distinct to the mountain trolls, but not quite the same <laughs> as the swamp trolls. You know, yeah. Why do we assume that we need to know all of these things? Well, you go, we don't. We, it's only we have an interest in it. And we've become so, um, I think part of it is in the modern day, smartphones and the internet. I don't know what this is. I'll just, I'll look it up. There is no deferment of waiting to find out what something, I'll just look it up now. I, I don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have no impulse control. I don't understand this one word. You are literally two chapters in. Why do you think you're going <laughs> to understand everything about the world two chapters in? Well, and, and what I find, did, did it, PL, did it, did it, um, I guess, divert or, or in any way take away from that epic ending, right? Like I, I, I... No, I think what I did, I made a conscious decision to uh, go, you know what, this is great. 
The writing is fantastic. I'm, I'm a sucker for the prose. The, uh, the scenes, especially the, the actually the battle scenes are so compelling. The intrigue for me was totally captivating. The Whiskey Jack plot, you know, what Rake is doing, you know, the Druidistan, you know, the, the, the assassins stuff. Like it, it was, I just decided, I'm just gonna read the damn thing and just enjoy that, it and forget about my, understanding yeah. it. And that's, and like I said, I clung on to my favorite characters and, you know, unfortunately I clung on to the whether they lived or died, uh, you know, <laughs> which wasn't necessarily a bad thing because of course, as we know, some don't completely die. Uh, so so I, I, I clung on to them and I kept reading and then I sat back when it was done and I remember closing the book and going, okay, can the man write? Oh, yes, he can. He's a fabulous writer. Did I enjoy the story? That was probably the, my hardest, the hardest question for me. It's like, I, I thought the story was brilliant. I thought it was extremely well-crafted. I thought that the parts I did understand were extremely enjoyable. But I guess for me, as AP said, it was that nagging, selfish, uh, you know, 21st century desire to know the things that I do not understand right now. I need to know, I need to understand it right now. And I'm an author and that makes it worse because, you know, I, I, sh I should understand if anybody should understand, I should, and I'm not. But then I said, you know what? But it's still a good book, a great book. And I figured down the road, I'd watch videos from AP, I'd watch videos from Bryce, I'd watch videos from Angie, I would watch videos from whoever, listen to Philip Chase, and they would help me figure it out, hence, you know, why I'm here. Well, yes, rule number will. one, never listen to Philip Chase. He's my nephew. <laughs> I knew this was coming at some point in this video. <laughs> but, but Peel, you're exactly um, right. The, um, and this, you know, this is something I try to emphasize. No one is saying you have to like the style that Erickson writes in. No one is saying that you, you can recognize it is a good book without actually enjoying it. You, you can recognize that something is, you know, technically bad, but you absolutely adore that um, personal preference and how you enjoy something is always going to be something that's deeply personal. And it, it will have to do with the style of writing, the style of narration, the characters that you encounter, the plot, the sequence of events as you meet them, the peaks and the troughs, the emotions, all of those elements go to your personal enjoyment. And we can recognize in books, because I've, uh, I've had the fortune, good fortune of being able to teach literature. And sometimes the books that I was teaching are not ones that I was going, oh goody, I get to teach this book today and it's my favorite book of all time. But you can't go into a room full of undergraduates and say, this book is crap. A, it's not. Uh, and you know it is not a crap book. What you mean is, I don't like this book. But there are elements to it that you go, look at this writing. Look at how the world is evoked. Look at how these characters are evoked. And it is a way of explaining how a book can be good, even if it doesn't fulfill the personal entertainment aspect that you were looking for. And another major, major element of that is that we are different readers at different parts of our lives. And something that you read when you are 20 years old and you go, this is stunning. And then when you're 40 years old and you reread it and you go, did I have a brain injury when I read this? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because you have changed so dramatically in 20 years. And PL will, will know this intimately. As a writer, you are putting down your story. You're, uh, you're trying to communicate something to a reader. But once it's out there, a reader takes that and they interpret it. And you have no control over that. You can try using all of the different literary techniques and tricks. You can try to shape how a reader is going to understand it. You can try to communicate to a reader and you've done your best to do that. But you don't know who your reader is going to be. You don't understand their life experience. You don't understand what point of life they are in. You don't understand their personal preferences. You just hope that your book will find the right readers, the ones that will respond to it, the ones that will resonate with it. That's, that's what you hope for. And 
Erickson is no different. He wrote a book in a style <clears throat> in conversation with what he saw, his perception of the genre, and trying to tell the story his way in a way that he thought wasn't as well represented in the genre. That did, it was basically the story that he wanted to see in the genre. And so that's what he wrote. Does that mean that you're dumb if you don't get it? No. Does, does it mean that if you don't like it, oh, well, you pleb? You're like, no. <laughs> that, none of that is true because we all have books that we can admire and still go, yeah, but like, I really wanted to read that one where the guy got punched in the face. That would have been, that was the one that I wanted. Um, <laughs> And that is absolutely fine. You, you don't have to love every single book. It's not a, it's not a cultural uh, tick point next to your name. It's not, not about getting points. And that's, that's what I love about Malazan is that you can have both. I can have the guy punched in the face and you can go super deep into it. You, I, I have both depending on the day. And, and, and the thing is, I, I totally understand that obviously as a writer, listen, the, well, the best review I ever had in my book was the worst review I ever had in my book. And, I, and they, the person hated my book. And, but the only reason they hated it was because of the main character. They said, the writing's great, the world building's great, this is great, but I cannot like this book. I can't give it a positive review because I totally detest the main character. Of course, I wrote him that way to be <laughs> detestable, right? So, but at the same time, you know, I, I believe that my issue was because AP is right. I mean, I went to school for English. I studied medieval literature. I read the classics. I read them when I was far, much younger than a university student. I probably read Paradise Lost when I was 14 years old. I read, you know, parts of the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was 15 and 16. I read Le Morte to Arthur when I was 17, 18. I, I, I've read some pretty, uh, what I think are most comp, somewhat complicated for by today's standards, books written in a very much more archaic language that I loved and I understood and I was, oh my, and, and I kept asking myself, why am I, but why am I not getting this the same way? So and that's when I had to dial back and go, wait a minute, hold on a second. Well, because you're not just reading it. Because those books, guess what I did? I just read them. I read them with no preconceived notions, with no expectations. I just read them. I enjoyed them. I saw the brilliance. I enjoyed the prose. I just, and, and I think ultimately that's what's, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to have to be my approach going forward mm -hmm. in this series. I'm just going to have to read them. And then as, as AP mentioned, reread them. And uh, I don't know how your re rereads have gone, Angie and Bryce yeah. uh, and AP, but uh, my reread, and I was just speaking to Bryce about this uh, on DMs prior to, I didn't pick up that much more. And that's my failing, not, not the book. However, mm -hmm. what I did pick up stayed with me. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe that's as, as good as I, I'm going to get with, with, mm -hmm. with Miles. And, but that's okay. Right? And I think that sometimes uh, a lot of people, when we tell them that we are going to start the series, uh, they tell you they in with good intention, of course, that you know, okay, be careful. There are a lot of characters. It's going to be complicated, and you expect to be complicated sometimes. You know, I think sometimes if if I had gone into this book without any expectations, maybe it would have not. I would have not looked for being <laughs> confused, maybe, and thinking, and also. Uh, never, I, I learned one good thing from the fandom is that never Google anything regarding Malazan because then you get spoilers and you know who dies, who lives, and all that. So uh, that's one good thing that I learned from fandom. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, they want me with good intentions, and sometimes I feel like, okay, I am supposed to be confused with this book. So maybe, I, I, you know, if I'm not confused, maybe am I missing something? <laughs> Or, you know, those, that kind of con conflict happens with me, I think. Yeah, I, I think, this, but this is a very modern thing because when these, these books were coming out, and admittedly, I, I didn't read the first ones as they came out because as people now quite famously know, the story of how I met Stephen Erickson. But skipping that for a moment, because um, it's embarrassing and I don't want to tell that story again. But when, when I was reading it, 
the first time I picked up Gardens of the Moon, uh, um, I tried to read, I went, oh, I'm not in the mood for it. And I put it down. And then I tried again and I got maybe a hundred pages in and I went, oh, I, I just put it down. I got busy. And then I went, you know, I'm just going to sit and read this. And instead of trying to figure it out, I just sat and I read, sat reading it and just seeing where the story took me. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I went, why, why was I finding it so difficult to get into the first two times that I picked it up? And in both those instances, because of what I was doing with my PhD, I was spending all this time analyzing and trying to figure things out instead of actually just reading it to find out what the, what was going on and just follow the story as it was and trust the fact that if something is important, the author will let me know at some point that mm. it's, it's not uh, predicated on working all of these things out. What I find with my reread because once I'd read the entire series once, and now I've done this reread with, with Philip Chase, we're nearly done. Um, but on, the, on rereading it, I'm going through it. And because I understand the vast majority of the, the context of the, enti a, the, the entire Malazan Book of the Fallen, but I'm much more familiar with the world. I'm much more familiar with the jargon in the world. That now it is like that opening of um, Saving Private Ryan. I now have that contextual knowledge about World War II that you need for that film. I have that now for Malazan because I've read the book, the series through once. And so a lot of the little elements that add additional resonance now are very vibrant and bold and stick out in the text that I can pick up on them more now because I'm aware of this reality and I'm familiar with this story world. But again, I would say you do not need to reread. Rereading is only ever adding to an experience. It is not necessary. And I think with partly because of our expectations in the modern genre, this we force ourselves to go, well, I should be experiencing. I should have recognized. I should have figured that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And when we don't know, when people say, oh, but you're meant to be confused. The, when we were reading this and we didn't have Discord, and in fact, even the online forums weren't as you know, big or as popular now as, as they, they have become, you didn't have people on YouTube talking about these books and explaining these yeah. books. But we all survived. We all managed <laughs> to read it. And then when you met up with someone who had read it as well, and you were talking about, oh, that bit there with, oh, do you remember when Ganos did this thing? And, oh, but that ties into that thing. Oh, I never thought of that. We had those mm. same conversations, but they weren't necessary to have at the same time as reading. And that was the big difference. These all happened after you'd finished the book. So you read the book, then discussed it. And I think part of the focus that we have now with, particularly with things like read-alongs and trying to read together, is that we're, we're reading a chapter at a time and then trying to analyze a chapter without knowing what that chapter is building toward. Mm. And that can be, that can add an element of confusion and difficulty and complexity to a text that it isn't actually that complex. But because we are reading it one chapter at a time and then trying to analyze it one chapter at a time without the knowledge of where it ends up, how are you meant to know what is being built toward? because suddenly you're, you're, you're trying to extrapolate in all directions from every single chapter. And that would drive anyone insane. And it will make the book seem a lot more complex than it actually is. That if you just, just sit down, read it, get to the end and go, hmm, okay, what did I not understand? Well, that was a bit strange. Flip back to that chapter, have a look at it again. And you can, the, the expectation that A, things are very visible and spelled out from the very beginning. There are narratives like that. Star Wars, again, a classic example. You know from the beginning, oh, look, the Death Star plans are not in the main computer. They've captured the princess, and then we skip to the farm boy. You're like, I wonder where this story is going. Mm -hmm. Everything is laid out as if we are five-year-olds, and you go, here's the story. Like, Shh, it's okay. I'm not going to throw anything complex at you. Here's all of the pieces. You're going to, and it's going to be very comforting and it's going to be exciting. And you know, the good guys are going to win. And 
there there is an element of comfort to that it is a story well told it is enjoyable but not every story has to be that and that's the thing that i love about literature that we can have an entire range of literature and people who insist that stories must follow a certain pattern and must be written in a certain style and must uh, use these certain things. You go, why are you dictating and narrowing the focus of what literature is? Because in every genre, science fiction, fantasy, horror, literary fiction, the new weird, um, historical fiction, epic, it, in all of these different genres, there may be a dominant form or a predominant form or a popular form, but there's still room in those genres to explore other things. And, and I love the, um, just how it's pretty much exploded, but self-publishing, independent publishing, I just feel like gives us even more of that, you know, that, that, you know, it's, maybe publishers, traditional publishers might have a harder time taking a gamble on something that isn't just the cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. That's been proven. It's been proven, you know, many times. Yeah. Um, but to be able to have just these different stories out there in, in, I'm just loving this, you know, the, this golden age really of, of literature that you can, you can have those different stories. And, and anyway, that's what I call it at least. And, uh, so anyway, that's, I, I just still am like amazed, even, you know, to some degree that, that even that, uh, you know, a publisher took a gamble on yeah. these stories, uh, because of how different they are. And I'm just so grateful because I, that's what I've done. Exactly what AP's described. I gave these to my friend and was like, you got to do this. You got to read it. And he like, suddenly he, he fast to read. He's a faster reader than I am and blazed through him faster than I did. And we were just constantly talking about him. Then, you know, we've moved away from each other, but we still have that, you know, especially that connection. And then he's gotten friends on, you know, Malaz and on uh, his own. And it's just like this thing that like unites us. It's so funny that we can just go into and and we just know exactly where we're at and it's also one of those series where you know um you know and especially i'm not only a writer i consider myself now a blogger or a viewer and i think in all of us angie i think we had talked about this when you had come on um page chewing with steve and i uh, mm -hmm. with and um <clears throat> books with zara that sometimes you can feel that there's these books out there that you feel you feel obligated, not necessarily obligated to read or review, but that in order to consider yourself quote unquote well read in your particular genre, fantasy, et cetera, that if I don't at least take a look at Malazan, you know, pick it up, mm. you know, buy it, even if it stays on my shelf, you know, the fact that, okay, I have an intention to read it, it is one of the quote unquote in most circles acknowledges one of the best, uh, you know, epic fantasy series out there. So if I don't give it a try, then I'm missing out on something or my, mm -hmm. my reading is incomplete. So I think um, part of that was why I picked it up. Uh, the curiosity really got to me eventually, you know, hearing people like Angie and like Bryce and like AP rave about this thing. Uh, you know, I think that really, and, and the fact that, listen, this, this book sold a million copies in one month. It, no, like it that, didn't. That is that is so that full that's from the Wikipedia page. That is okay. actually incorrect. Is that incorrect? Yep. That that I made wow. that mistake as well. I had lifted it because I was in a rush, looked at the Wikipedia page. Well, that's a brilliant statistic. It's wrong. That it didn't wow. sell a million in a month. Um it I think it sold a million in the, the first some maybe five years. Oh okay. that's that's the or, I, I mean I mean I, I, well, thanks for clarifying that, AP. I, I didn't know that because I don't think it was Wikipedia I saw that. I saw that on some article about, about uh, either a review or something about this book. But that's, it, that fact got out somewhere, has been on the Wikipedia page, and then it's self, mm. self then replicated through all it. Because everyone then uh, is constantly referring mm. back to different, and so it just keeps going. But no, it didn't sell a million in a month. Uh, but I, well, I, I, I always reference <laughs> Wikipedia in all of my term papers. So, okay. <laughs> no, well, you know what? A million copies period to me is is an astounding accomplishment for any book. I think any 
you know, I'm a self-published author. You know, if you told me I could sell a million copies of all of the books I ever read in my lifetime combined, uh, you know, in, in, you know, over the next 20 years, I would be ecstatic with, with those sales numbers, right? So, you know, but, but yeah, I, what I'm trying to say is that there has to be something to this right. and this series for it to be so popular and inspire the fandom that it does and to have people I respect and whose opinion I respect, such as Angie and Bryce and AP, to have them so enamored with this thing. Like, they're, they're, like you, there's a point where, okay, yes, I can read it and not be for me, but, you know, some part of my brain says, there's got to be something to this. After reading it, I'm slowly starting to see why. And if nothing else, like I said, I just take my favorite parts, my favorite characters, Whiskey Jack, Paran, Rake. You know, I was, you know, for example, that whole, uh, you know, for me, the, the, my, my, one of my favorite scenes, again, you know, I, I liked Rake. I, I, I love those mysterious baddies. And, you know, a seven foot giant with a sword as big as me, when he shows it, like, there's no way he's not throwing down. There's no way that he is not. You don't introduce a character like that, that has that reputation, that looks to mm -hmm. be, you know, this is someone who's so going to be so formidable and give him this huge sword hanging at his back that he's not going to fight. And when he does, when he faces that demon, of course, it is completely epic. So, but I was nervous for him because obviously this is a book where you can imagine, you know, that whole J.R. thing, no one's probably safe. Well, obviously from reading prior to that, no one is safe. So is Rick, is Rick going down, right? Is Rick going down here? And so I, I, I found a lot to love. But again, it, it's, it's, you know, other people who I respect and love this series and admire this series for the writing for so many aspects so i that's why i'm so encouraged to, to give it a shot um you know i said after if i if i if i if i'm not still loving it after four books because it's such a long series i'll tap out that but i'm committed to the first four at least and we'll see from there but right now i'm i'm invested well, and even um gardens is known as one of like people's least favorite it's always been a wow. top favorite for me but yeah um, I love it I know it is kind of generally known as wow, like people's okay. least but I'm and I it, for me yeah. yeah I read uh I'm just halfway through memories of ice I have like stopped it for now because I wanted to completely focus on it and because of other things going on in at work and all that I have put a stop to it for now Dead House Gate was I think out of the three least favorite of mine I think, but I really love Memories of Ice, and I think Islands of the Moon is so far my favorite. Also, I think um, the plot is good. Uh, like you said, the writing is really amazing, the prose, everything. But for me, I think I love the characters also. I think the characters need to be talked about also a lot from in Malazan because some of the most brilliant characters. I mean, yeah. Um, for me, I'm I don't have a least favorite character surprisingly uh do any of you have least favorite character in garden of the moon i don't well, i mean like well, a hated character i mean, hair lock, I mean character. Hair lock, hair lock, i mean assuming that he yeah. is bad assuming that he's crazy and evil right i think it'd be hard I, I to thought he was just crazy i don't know if he's evil <laughs> i don't well, know and, and i'm not and i'm not sure again like you said angie see <laughs> and i'm not sure right but i think yeah. I, I almost think it might be a red herring. Maybe, maybe as I read on, maybe Erickson is setting us up that meanwhile Hairlock is the savior of the whole series. You know, I, I don't know, but 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 from what I from what I remember reading, he's my least favorite character because he's nominally, I think, mm -hmm. out of all the characters, less gray, good or bad, but more bad. But again, maybe I'm I'm mistaken, right? So I was thinking a little bit creepy for me was Krupp. Or or whatever I, loved his name is. <laughs> I, I loved it. I, loved it. I, I liked his first chapter where he's dreaming and you know he's thinking about this hunger and all. I was like, okay, fine. And then it uh, it goes in a different direction with him. I'm like, I don't know if I want to like him or not. <laughs> I, was I, I think and he's I was, some kind of puppet master. I don't know what to what extent yeah. yet, but he is a Machiavellian type. He's a manipulator. I don't know to what extent, but he's he's an influencer, right? And oh, he's one of the most genius. He's one of the most genius characters to me. 
I was, I remember being so confused on that dream sequence when you first kind of, mm-hmm. inter- you're introduced to him. Uh, but then I remember just being like, this is so zany. I love him, but I know he's a love him or hate him kind of character. But even the ones that I hate, the characters that I hate are like, all I do is go, oh my gosh, to get this kind of level of emotion in me is mm-hmm. just such powerful writing and characterization here. Uh, it just, it, it's profound. <laughs> but one of the one of the things I find interesting about Crop, so yes, we have those dream sequences and the dream sequences that Krupp has are clearly magical dreams. And we're used to this in all sorts of fantasy, that dreams can be true seeing, dreams can allow you to walk in your dream that you're actually there, you're in some sort of dream world. The rules of a dream world are not the same as the rules of the reality we live in. And, you know, we experience that in our own dreams that, you know, suddenly you're walking down the corridor, you're dreaming that you're walking down the corridor in your school and you open the door and suddenly you're on the side of a cliff because that cliff was definitely in your school. That, that's how dreams work, dream logic. Mm-hmm. And we have that with Krupp, except because of his magic, it takes on this added dimension of actually having a reality. It has, it has an impact. It allows him insight into things. And then we see how he presents himself in the world, where we have that sequence where he's walking along and he's waving his hands around like that and casting magic spells, using magic to steal right. food and hide it and, and pick pockets. And he's constantly and then eating at the same time. All the while talking and everyone sort of looks at him as this, he's described as cherubic. Like he looks very innocent. He looks like he isn't a threat. And yet we see how masterful he is. He is a master thief, a master mage. And it turns out, He's the ill. He is the head of intelligence, of manipulating everyone in this city. And um, he's Kaiser Sose. But he's Kaiser Sose with a sense of humor. I was going to say the prestige, humor. right? The prestige, right? Yeah, a lot of yeah. That. this innocuous look, totally, completely innocuous looking guy who you think is just, and, and couldn't, if push came to shove, couldn't even defend himself, much less defend it. And we found it again, exactly the opposite. Right. And, and that's, that's, but, but I think the, the, the thing that I think is, is, is really, to be honest with you, if I look at all things that are really keeping me jazzed about this series and moving forward after a uh, garden's of the moon is the element of, um, shall we say, um, reincarnation, um, uh, being brought back to light, you know? So in other words, you know, um, if your favorite character dies off, they may be dead, but are they dead? And, will they return and to what extent in what body who like so now you know i I, that's given me a whole new take after getting to end the book on this series yeah and i this is something i think that also trips up a lot of readers because they go well you know if a character dies they should stay dead you if you set up your narrative world your story world where you know when someone dies they die you go right and then you have a fake out death or they oh they're not really dead then you're sort of betraying the rules of the world and it can feel cheap. But when you you set up the story world that is meant to be this giant metaphysical reality with all of these different layers and and types of, of life and realms and the realm of the dead and the gods interfering, that you have this entire sort of spectrum of existence, then, you know, we see early on, uh, Riga gets killed, but we know she's ended up inside Sari's body. So her soul is separate to her body. So the soul in some respects could be eternal and therefore can carry on existence. But what does that mean about the soul then? Are you your soul or are you your body? And it asks questions about that. Ganos gets gets knifed in the back very quickly. Ah, I'm here to take command. Dead. But he gets brought back. It's established so, very early on. Who, that, who won the bet then, right? <laughs> That's the question. But it gets established very early on that this is not trying to be our world. This is a fantasy world that operates under different rules. And when we try to impose what should be in a text by going, this, this isn't realistic. This is what the world is. And you go, if you want realism then maybe reading high fantasy is, is not the genre for you. 
because one of the things of that high fantasy and epic fantasy and, and military fantasy, one of the things right. it can do, doesn't necessarily do, but it can bend the rules or break the rules of metaphysics that apply in our world. And as long as it's consistent within its story world, that those rules are, are applied sort of consistently within the world that the author has set up. It's, oh, but it's so unrealistic that he got brought back to life. You know, but we're, we're told, A, it's rare. B, when we're following a story, we are following people who are important to the story, not necessarily important to the world, but are important to the story. So it's more likely that some of them are gonna survive, but also a lot of people do just die. And they, oh, but they're not important. You go, well, they're not important anymore because they're dead. Like Lorne dies in this book. I go, oh, well, she's not important then. Yeah. So you want important people to be killed off and not come back. But if they get killed off and don't come back, you then describe them as unimportant. Sorry, I'm having difficulty following your logic. Lorne is an important character and gets killed off. Yeah, um, yeah but Ganos didn't. And you're like, yeah. And? <laughs> some people do and some don't. No one can count on it. No one goes, oh, I'm definitely coming. Oh, run me through. It's not Highlander. Well, and, it's, not and it's setting up on this this third time through. It's like, it's all there. It's like, he hears the coin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, you. it's not like it's just happening and he's coming back. And, and like AP is saying is, this is a, it, it's not, it's very clear in the, the place, you know, and then the glossary and everything, there's a hood. There's a, 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 a leader, so to say, of the dead, of a world of the dead. And then in you, you find out more about how other peoples and cultures can access their dead in other ways. And, so, and, and all the barrows that are just somehow all over the place and and then you know raced himself can get resurrected somehow right and it's like it's all part of it it's it's all built into it yeah and you have yeah. you know when you have which is a, a facet that i love i love meddling capricious gods i love i absolutely eat up gods that will come back meddle in things just just sometimes as you know what disturbance just because or because it's some part of some grand plan that they're manipulating people for their own designs that you know parent isn't brought back for his good looks right you know he's he's brought back to serve a purpose and i also think that when you combine parents now um return with tattersale being killed and now her soul potentially being planted in a child, in a baby, and that because they're, well, they're in love, now, well, their, 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 their relationship, I believe they're in love, I'm not sure, but, but, but certainly left to their own devices, they would have continued their relationship seemingly. And he's hoping, he's, he's going to be hoping that, you know, she grows up fast enough, I think, that he can reconnect with her on that that level. Who knows what she's going to feel? But at least that's what that at least that's what the author is leading us to believe. Certainly, AP is um, laughing at us. So. AP is laughing because he's read it. He knows that, but <laughs> no, I don't. No, no, I don't just, know what happens. So. Yeah. No, no, but, you know. I'm just thinking of this. So Tatter said, "Yeah, wishful me. thinking." The, yeah. the 215 or 200 and whatever year old sorceress who died and her soul and the soul of other people have been put into this baby. And yeah. then Paran, who has been killed, come back. Yeah. And yeah. they have this tumultuous, tempestuous, um, emotion-driven sexual relationship, yeah. which is very much like, you know, someone going on a holiday to some hot and sunny land and falling in love with the waiter and having this fling and going, oh, we're so deeply yeah. in love and it's yeah. this passionate yeah. affair. You know, they haven't actually lived together in real life. I reckon they... Yeah. If they had about a month of living in the same house, they go, you know what? This was a really bad idea. It's a pleasure meeting you. We had fun. I'll see you later. But in that moment, because she's just lost her lover, yeah. all of her, a load of her friends, she's a, an emotional wreck from all of this loss and devastation around her. He's just been murdered and come yeah. back from the dead. So he's, he's feeling a little bit psychologically delicate. And they're hiding out basically in this room together. And mm -hmm. she's sexy. He's, he's young and sexy. And they go, 
Yeah. Fancy a go? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like two grown adults maybe do if they're stuck in the yeah. same room for a month and they're both single. But they start this, this affair. And for them, uh, I find that relationship very, very believable because yeah. they need each other. They are looking for right. uh, that physical comfort because they are so both psychologically damaged and traumatized by the events that this is comfort. And because of that, I think they both read too much into it. Too much into it. Mm. Um, but it was when you said her soul and like these souls go into a baby. So Paran's going to wait for the baby to grow up to maybe <laughs> you go. OK, so I just imagine someone going, right. So how old are you? You're six months. Right. Has anyone seen the Twilight films or read the Twilight yeah. books? Because that has to be one of the creepiest scenes of yeah, the end. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Where you're the right. grown man <laughs> right. looks at the baby and they go, we're soulmates. You just go, oh. Uh. <laughs> you're right. You're right. And, and, and I guess because it's fantasy, you have this, okay, you accept these things that, that whether it's, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, you know, interview with a vampire with, you know, you have this concept of, you know, these, all these lovers that are mortal going to die. And then, you know, you want to extend their life by biting, like, you know, it's that whole thing about, you know, um, the mortality versus immortality and, and aging. And, you know, so, but yeah, it's, uh, it, I find that something that is compelling for me. One of the storylines I want to see that is, does this, does, first of all, does parent live long enough to see the baby grow up? Because, you know, considering the lifestyle he's leading, and and do the and does the baby get to grow up and does Tatter sail does her soul does does you know how does that manifest because there's other souls in there so will they she still want to be with Perrin if they need like you know that's that's but, one of the things I'm curious to see. But even without answering any of that, even think of the nature versus nurture debate, because how how much if if your soul now went into a new body and grew up would it still be you? Yeah. Would it still be the same person? Yeah. And you go, well, actually, yeah. wouldn't that yeah. change you? And so there's all, there's actually a really interesting question that you get about when, when someone comes back, are they changed? How much are they changed? Mm. Because we mm. are uh, both, there are things that are intrinsic to our nature and we have predispositions for things, but also we are shaped by our experiences and our experiences are obviously the sum of, all of our interactions with other people. And so we're shaped by the world around us. And that world around us is shaped by what happened in the past. So the past is shaping us, the people around us shape us, um, how we grew up, our interactions, they shape us. And this is something that we see time and time again in even in Gardens of the Moon, because you have the aspect of why are they trying to conquer? This was part of the emperor's plan. Why uh, does Lorne feel that way about Tattersail? It was Lucine's purge that we saw at the beginning in the prologue, that event where Lucine had ordered them to go and get rid of all of these mages and wax witches and ordered the company down there. That's where Tattersail is. So Lucine caused Tattersail to do that. And we see the resolution of that basically in the dinner scene. So something that happened all those years in the past is suddenly coming to the fore now. Rist, a tyrant from thousands of years ago, is suddenly coming to the fore now. That the past is not a far and distant country. The past is mm. underneath the very surface of where we are. If you scratch the surface of the present, that's where the past is. It is with us all the time. And I think our, uh, Ericsson and Esselmont's archaeological training comes very much to the yeah. fore in this kind of aspect and perspective. These books take both a, a sort of step back, an anthropological sort of step back to avoid that judgment about who is good and who is evil. It's trying to mm -hmm. see what it is that people are doing and leaving it up to the reader to judge. So it's a slightly more, I think, anthropological take. But in terms of archeology, span looking at how the world is actually shaped by the past, that these events are the natural uh, results of decisions that were made before that are taking time to play out. And I feel like this is the, because Erickson and Esselmont are archeologists and they've just had, this is the first series and, and you know one of the only that 
really has thought about, I mean, one of the, what's one of the lines that Anamanda Rake is, what is he tasted a, you know, a hundred thousand winners, or I, I forget what the line is, but a hundred thousand years, right? Like, oh, like mm. the, the sheer amount of time that that is, that mm. 3000 years really wouldn't be that much for them. Like, so like a, a good vast amount of time for us would not, would just be still a blink of the eye for them. <laughs> just that they, they really made me contemplate like, oh my gosh, like this. And then how the, the, the Tistiandi get, get to where they, they are. And yeah, anyway, I don't want to go crazy. too deep, but just, just this like idea of the past and how vast that is and what that really means to these characters. Anyway, just it, like, but, but it, even when, when Rick is talking to Baruch, the alchemist and you know, uh, Baruch is basically saying, like, how much do we have to pay you to to defend the city? And, yeah. and Rick is just, he's sort of, you don't need to pay us. Like, I, I need to do something to stop my people falling right. on me. Yeah. I, I need to give them something to do because otherwise mm. they will just sit there and not move mm. for centuries. Mm. The dust will yeah. gather on them and we will right. just fade. And so you suddenly get this sense it's not that you're given this whole backstory about Rick. Again, so much of it is implied. People tell you mm. things about him, but what they tell you about him doesn't necessarily match to what we see. Yes. We get this impression of him as this hugely powerful yes. Lord. Yes. Blah, blah. And then he turns up at Baruch's place. <laughs> there's a glass of wine. Yeah. He, has a coke. Like, he has a sense of humor. And he's saying, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to give my people something to do. And you suddenly go, even with his alienness, even with his different view of the world, there are certain things that link us. And, you know, that is something I think that is, comes across quite strongly in this. When we see the, the bridge burner perspective, we're very much on their yeah. side. When we go to Darugistan and we're with Cutter and Murillo yeah. and Call, and yeah. we're very much on their side. Mm -hmm. And you go, how can we be on both sides of a conflict? Mm -hmm. I mean, because the story in Darugistan is them trying to deal with what's going on in Darugistan. And they're not worried about the army coming. That's not what they're focused on. They're, they're trying to um, get rid of Lady Simtal and sort all of that stuff out. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the bridge burners who we love and we think are these great scrappy soldiers and oh, they're Whiskey Jack, he's an honorable man. And oh, Callum, he's a, he's a kick ass and quick Ben, oh, he's sneaky. And what do we see them doing in Darugistan? Planting Bobby. landmines, yeah. planting landmines in the that middle is. of the public thoroughfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this, this is why I, I have seen in, in people discussing this, them going, oh, this is so pro-colonialism. And you go, how can you say that when so many of the things that we see the colonial empire do, this, this mm -hmm. empirical force, uh, empire force moving across, the things that we see them do are war crimes. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and it, 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 that, to be honest with you, that whole the dichotomy there, it really astounded me. And, and it astounded me in that because of that specifically, by the time we get to Lauren's death, I felt a sense of loss. And I didn't like Lauren for the whole book. I didn't like Lauren for the whole book until when she died. And then I thought back about her role and I thought back about her role specifically as the right hand to the Empress. And I thought back about her role. And at first I felt she was just, you know, totally manipulating power and because, you know, power is my favorite character. And, oh, but then when I put things in perspective, I was like, wait a minute. But then Whiskey Jack and these guys who are not essentially double crossing the double cross because they feel that they they were, they felt that they were, they were set up as pawns to get taken off the board from day one. Um, I was like, wait a minute. You know what? I, I kind of, feel empathy for 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 Lord now because and that's the brilliance I guess of of Erickson in that he was able to do that right mm -hmm. um, and you also have this kind of like some of the characters like justify well look how like good the people of yeah. the Malazan Empire have it you know and you know we yeah. want to keep that going it, it just it's like you're oh man yeah it's, look how good the people of the malazan empire have it as long as there isn't a riot going on and the army is yeah. coming in to wipe them all out yeah. um, right. that they're not having a purge well you know apart mm. from those days oh the malazan empire is great <laughs> <laughs> but 
this is one of the things that I, I gen we talk so much about how we want morally ambiguous characters. We want complex characters. And we, we tend to focus on it on, on this scale of, again, good or bad. And mm -hmm. I think what Erickson does is he takes that idea of moral alignment and throws it out the window yeah. and goes, no, I am going to make them people. And mm -hmm. I'm not looking at it through a lens of good or bad. I'm looking at it a lens of what is that person doing? Where are they? What are their decisions? They are trying to make the best of the situation that they are in instead of applying a moral test to them. Yeah. He yeah. is trying to evoke a sense of how someone would act in a situation. And for, it was interesting what you said about Lorne. For me, the dinner sequence is where I yeah. suddenly developed right. empathy for Lorne because seeing her in that moment go from being the adjunct to asserting, no, I am Lorne, Tattersiel, you murdered my family. And she's wrong. Tattersiel wasn't responsible for the murder of her family. But we can see that she blames Tattersiel. And it is so human and so raw. And you can feel her pain. And this, is, this isn't the adjunct talking anymore. This is yes. Lorne, the person. And then Dujek shuts her down. Yeah. And we see yeah. the adjunct the role reassert itself and who that person Lorne was gets scrunched up into right, a yes. tiny ball and pushed all the way down. And that for me was so tragic and heartbreaking yes. that in that short sequence at a dinner table, someone I disliked became someone I felt enormous empathy and sympathy for and then became a tragic figure that I pitied in the yeah. space of a very short narrative sequence. And That's for great. people who say Erickson can't write, that this is badly written, it's moments like that that I point to, to go in such a short space to manage that transition and to do it so intentionally, because you can, I could bring it up on the screen and go through it to show you how it is done that it is incredibly well written. And it doesn't, you know, if you don't like it, that's fine. But that's not the same as saying it's bad writing. And mm -hmm. Lorne for me became this beautifully tragic figure that you realize that so much of her projection of the adjunct, the figure that I hated at the beginning who was manipulating Ganos. Yeah. That figure, the adjunct, that's not Lorne. That's the role that she is playing. And she has been made cold and she has been made hard because she must in that role. Yeah. And then we see the vulnerability of her. Mm -hmm. And then we see how the empire, the needs of the empire crush the individual. And that, that's an excellent point. And that goes back to that incredible point that it, it had to sink in for me that AP made about that this is military fantasy and these people are soldiers. And that is something, I don't know why, when I was reading the book, despite the obviousness of it, despite the rank structure, despite, you know, everything is laid out as military fantasy. The so like that, that, you know, we forget that a soldier, mm. what they're doing is not, good or bad in terms of their general duties. Their duties are to serve in the military of the kingdom, country, realm, et cetera, that they're affiliated with. They get paid to do that. They're sworn to do that. That's their, their national duty or obligation. They're paid to do the bidding of whatever. So a soldier in the United Kingdom, a soldier in the United States, a soldier in India, a soldier in Canada, a soldier wherever, that's, they are not, what they're doing is it good or bad? It's what the country perhaps is doing that can be doing good or bad, but they are following orders and they're following a directive. And you can mm -hmm. pit soldiers against each other who may be the most loving, caring, you know, <laughs> wonderful people, but what they are have to do can be yeah. awful. Well, it, or it what explains, they have to, 
Yeah, or what they have to what do. The, the bridge burners were doing with planting those bombs in the floor, no. thoroughfares. Yeah, but, but what what do soldiers do? Every, almost every military in the world has munitions, right? Almost every military in the world has has um, you know. It, it, if you look at every military in the world, they will have uh, units that are designed for explosive. They will have infantry that are designed essentially frontline killing people. They will have intelligence. They will have all these things. It, 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 it doesn't matter which military you're part of, they all have these things. And mm. at the end of the day, what are armies designed to do? Their, their primary duty is to kill people. Kill. That's what they're yeah. designed to do. They're, they're, it is, it is the, and, but it's all about what the state, how the state is using them and deploying them to kill people and for what purpose. That is the difference. So I think it comes down to whether the state is evil, you know, because we'd all argue that, you know, um, some wars are fought justly or for just reasons versus, you know, uh, wars that are evil, right? Mm -hmm. uh, defense versus attack, you know, aggression versus protection. Uh, but even then, like right. those, some of those justifications can depend very heavily on, on your point of view, because exactly. take Alexander the Great, expanding and bringing civilization to the world <laughs> you know and you know people in certain countries might have been sitting there going well we're we're fine this is who's this guy Ale <laughs> i'm alexander the great I've, i'm here to bring you civilization you know, <laughs> well we're okay we we're, we're pretty sick yeah. you know alexander the great not so great if you lived in a place that he was naked like <laughs> Right. Yeah. And also with uh, Erickson, I think uh, it, it reflects more in Dead House Gates, I think, in his writing these uh, war scenes and battles. And when, he, when we are hearing about all these, he never glorifies war or, you know, which you usually see in other fantasies, maybe or military fantasy where war is glorified or war heroes and all that. But you get to see in the ground level what a soldier goes through, his trauma, and that is that really comes uh, to haunt you in Dead House Gates a lot, I think. <laughs> but we are not talking about that uh, here. But still, uh, that was I had to stop the book midway through Dead House Gates because it was really affecting me because the, the trauma of the soldiers, they are there with no food, water, and then their um, comrades are dying and uh, it, it was and but he, he even though it's pure fantasy we know this is a story but it affects you and that's how brilliantly he is portraying this without glorifying uh, either part either parties right yeah. and I, so I, I love think, that aspect yeah I think part of it is some of the stories that we love you, you realize there is an inherent truth to them a truth about something but it is presented in very pretty lies that fiction is this form of lying that is actually containing an element of truth that it is mm -hmm. it is trying to to explore not necessarily dictate to us but explore an aspect of and it sounds trite to say it but the human condition and what i find that erickson because of his particular focus on uh, the different perspectives in war, in conflict, um, in different societies. It's a way of investigating and asking questions. And instead of the simple binary that we fall into so easily of that is good, that is bad, that is evil, that is good, um, you're wrong, I'm right, that we, we fall into simplistic binaries. And a part of what I think motivated Erickson in the Malazan Book of the Fallen is to get rid of simplistic binaries, to get rid of the straightforward notion of a nice dyadic pair, to go, no, things are on a spectrum and they move on that spectrum. They don't remain fixed. And with colonialism, there are benefits to being colonized coming from a country that has been colonized. But it's not all positive. There are enormous negatives to being colonized. And so while it's very easy to say, oh, colonization is bad, and oh, it should never be done. And you go, okay, fine. But there are benefits to it. 
And whether or not those benefits outweigh the negatives, that is an interesting area to explore. And it's not the same in every single instance. But we, we've fallen into this trap of labeling something and going, that is bad. I don't need to think about it anymore. I don't need to investigate it. And what literature does is it gives us that psychic distance from something that happened in the real world. Because if someone writes a novel investigating, um, or someone writes a book investigating Northern Ireland and the politics of Northern Ireland, that is very raw. And anyone from here reading it, first of all, there will be preconceptions about how the information is relayed, what side you are on, how you frame things. And all of that will result in your book being derided by one side and praised mm. by the other. But if you take, say, the Northern Ireland history and you place it in a fantasy world and you remove the signifiers that, so people don't know it's, it's Northern Ireland, but you present a lot of the same elements, it allows us to think about them dispassionately, to feel empathy for both sides. And when we build up empathy for what we traditionally see as the other side, we sometimes realize that the difference in our opinion is usually only about 10%, that we agree on 80 to 90% of things, but the 10% we disagree on is the stuff that we yell about loudest. And if we could build on what we have in common, if we could actually build on that aspect, I think that's where empathy, compassion that we find in, in understanding these different perspectives actually gives us a, almost like a life lesson or, or something to consider for this world, for our reality, that you don't have to agree with the other side, but by understanding them, that we might actually be able to come to accommodations that suit everyone to a greater or lesser extent. I blame yeah. uh, the U.S.'s uh, two-party system for a lot of uh, the false dichotomous thinking. You know, the, this there is there's one way, and then the other is the bad guy, and and mm -hmm. we we do absolutely a lot of that, absolutely, and it is that, that's what I love about the series. I think too, exactly, it's that spectrum that there everything is complex. Not, I mean, there are a few things that are not more than just the two sides to it and especially with you know my career my what I do is you're you spot those kind of arguments and then you pick those apart in court and and say well they made you believe or tried to make you believe that there's these two options but guess what mm. that's false <laughs> here's the rest of them yeah, yeah but, I, I, but the talk, yeah, you're talking about complexity uh, is, um, I don't know if this is off track, but I have a question to AP or any one of you. Uh, how adaptable to uh, on screen is Malazan? It's all these kind of, um, you know, different stories, storylines going in and, you know, these complex characters in terms of not just like, there are so many things I think only a reader can understand. I don't know how well it would be adapted on screen like to, like to, I, I don't think it can be a movie but yeah maybe a tv series <laughs> well certainly bryce and ap are, as, are far more more would be far more savvy with answers but i will say this only because ap rightly so called me out the other day on uh on page shooting asking when i was talking about if my books would ever be adapted in a movie how much of 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 a uh, revision uh deletion of of the original would be what I would I accept depending on how much money I was given mm -hmm. and I was like oh well you know I I would only you know I mean if, if they if they really destroyed my original content oh no it doesn't matter how much money I would they 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 gave me I would never allow that to happen and and AP uh, astutely pointed a few things out to me which you know um again you have to accept okay well yeah that's a pretty valid point there um but but I will say this about my limited novice experience with reading this particular book, I feel that, and again, you know, AP and Price, I'm sure would be a lot, have a lot more salient points about this in that um, I believe that you would have to lose um, a percentage 
of 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 the main plot to to get in like a I don't know a five 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 year series thing on 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 one I, I mean I and maybe I'm I'm oversimplifying it but but I think with if you took the core plot like the core plot threads mm -hmm. and left everything else out sure but mm -hmm. but I think you would lose a lot. Uh, perhaps of the, of the richness from, and you spend a hell of a lot on right. effects and and with different cultures and the way all the different cultures look, and right. you know, like there would be a lot of you know a floating, a, you know, a, a floating you know city. Like I mean, this would be pretty uh, pretty uh, extensive in terms of you know SF uh, budgets and like if you're gonna do you know the way it, do justice to it, I think. But again, I'm not. That's more. APs probably and oh, I just want to see anime. Anime I think could do pretty good with it. I was about to say maybe it's easier if we do an anime for that, right? Yeah. yeah but You're when right. you say anime, do you mean anime or do you mean animated? Right. Because anime is a very particular style of animation and even within anime yeah, there are yeah. particular styles. So yeah. Yeah. But anime, I mean like Japanese anime. Yeah, but do you mean something anime. like um Fist of the North Star? Or do you mean something closer to, um, say, Final Fantasy, uh, The Spirits Within? Ooh, good, good question. Mm -hmm. Those are two radically different styles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I so always, we, you know, like Studio Ghibli, for instance, would, like, I don't know, get some Studio of Ghibli the Studio Ghibli with that soft, parts. cartoony look? That you, with the corrupt parts, right? <laughs> yeah, my, <laughs> my neighbor thinking. Totoro in But Malazzo. then you have to, <laughs> exactly, but then, yeah. Just ooh, I'm, ooh, I'm, ooh. I'm, I'm, I'm very bad at <laughs> <on> my <laughs> But when, when you think about adaptation, like people always say, oh, you could never do it. Look at Amazon's adaptation, or sorry, a Netflix adaptation of The Sandman. For years, people said, oh, The Sandman was unadaptable. You could never do it because of these mm. amazing vistas. Look at what they did with The Sandman. And it, it's a stunning adaptation. And... Is it word for word exactly? No, they have moments from the comic that are, you can look at the frame and you can see it on the screen. But there are other things that they change. They change the plot. They change the sequence of the narrative events. They have woven in a through line for this first season that isn't necessarily the through line that we find in the comics. They changed aspects of the different comic episodes to make the TV show. They changed things. They altered things. But the spirit, the truth of that story, the essential nature of it, its essence, is what's being communicated. And it, believe it or not, is live action. And if you look at that comic book and go, there's no way that you could do this as live action. This would have to be animated. Oh, but how would you ever do this? And you go, look, they did it. it yeah. Because I think a lot of the time is when we like animation, we go, oh, I want more animation, so this should be animated. And you go, that's because we like it. But to be able to say there's no way that you could do this is a failure of our imagination because you can, you could do a live action adaptation of Malaza. And if you wanted a TV show, you go, well, how would you adapt it? And you go, it depends. Do you want a TV show? How many seasons are we getting? How many episodes per season and how long is each episode? Because those are structural constraints that will limit what you're going to show. Mm -hmm. Then when you have that sorted out, you go, right, I now know how many seasons, how many episodes, what the runtime is. Now I will look at the actual text and I'll see how I can break it up. Or they go, okay, you're going to do it in films. You know, The Lord of the Rings, three books, three films. You, know, you could probably do that for uh, Gardens of the Moon, Memories of Ice and Dead House Gates. You could probably do that in a three, two and a half, three hour film, much like the Lord of the Rings movies. You could do that. Would you lose things? Yes. Just like Peter Jackson lost huge yes. chunks of the yes. Lord of the Rings like, when he adapted yes. it. Yeah. But we don't go, oh, Jackson's films are terrible. They're awful. He <laughs> lost so much. Just, it didn't recreate the books for me. Oh, you go, I, I think the worry is not having a, a last airbender situation. You know, I like, I, I'm willing to wait for it to be a good one, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and people go, oh, it, but even, even like Wheel of Time, the TV adaptation, yeah. I know some people had issues with it, but 
But look at the, the battle that Moraine had in the first episode against the Trollocs, all of the special mm -hmm. effects involved yeah. in that. That looked mm -hmm. brilliant. And remember, that's a TV show. That's yeah. not a film. That's not yeah. a feature yeah. film. It's not a blockbuster. It's not in the mm -hmm. theater with that kind of the MCU level of money to it. The, mm -hmm. This was a TV show. And you look at the special effects on that and go, that's a TV show and they managed to do that. You go, oh, but that thing wasn't good. We are applying a level of uh, requirement on special effects on TV shows that even blockbuster films from two years ago could not yeah. match. Yeah. And the level of expectation and the, the, what we feel we are entitled to, you go, it's unrealistic that you have to you have to meet the medium halfway and something like animation uh anime is is obviously there's a whole selection of styles within anime but even with an animation do you want something that is more photorealistic do you want something that's more stylistic do you want something that is 3d do you want something that is 2d there are so many different ways to achieve adaptation do you want something that is really close to the source text or would you rather they took the source text and translated it into a filmic medium and went, right, that is what the inspiration is. We're now going to rewrite the entire story to fit the new medium so it flows as a TV show. And that way you have a new narrative to experience where you are picking up on, oh, I see what they did there. Oh, I know that thing. Instead of, oh, well, they changed that. What, what do, you, do you want the same thing told over and over again? Or do you want it different? And all of these are different choices. And I think we, we get very bogged down in the fact that how, <laughs> how are they going to replicate the language on screen? Well, right. <laughs> why did they replicate yeah. Tolkien's language on screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cinematography English. has its own language. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because um, uh, in our heads, I think we all know, okay, for example, if I see an adaptation of Guards of the Moon, the, in my head, I have this the, the plot points that I, I, I want to see Rake mm -hmm. draw this humongous sword from his back and cut a demon's head off. I want yeah. to see, you know, um, you know, a, the scene where Perrin gets stabbed in the alley. I want to see, you know, the big battle with Hairlock being blown in half and, you know, and, 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 and you know, the, like, the, we can all visualize the action sequence. And those little quiet moments too, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, maybe with with Ben and and Whiskey Jack having a, a conversation, and you know, like we don't want to see, but the question is, how will that look when it's when it's adapted, and will it please us? And That's pleasing the, everybody's impossible, but but you know. we can isolate. You can isolate within the text key moments, kernels, things that you sort of go. This, this is iconic, or this is important to have this exact scene. So that dinner sequence, I would imagine that that dinner mm -hmm. sequence, because it is so pivotal for Tattersail and Lorne, who are obviously very important characters, is pivotal, uh, pivotal for them. It is very important for the establishment of Dujek and his role, and also in establishing who Talk is and what Talk's loyalties are. Yeah. That, right. that whole dynamic, that I think is a really important sequence. So in an adaptation, I am imagining that that sequence would be there very close to how it is in the book. But would you have it constantly, like when Lorne is speaking and she's looking at Tattersail, are you going to see Lorne speaking or are you going to be watching Tattersail's reaction? Like that's a choice that you make that is going to make it different from well, the book because narrative yeah. perspective will shift. And then in the but the like the Dune movie, for instance, the new Dune movie, uh, just cut out their dinner scene, and I thought that yeah. was yeah. pivotal. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was, yeah. and yet the you, had, Dune, you had to have it. <laughs> but that Dune yeah. film, you realize they didn't it because they they excised that because they're focusing on different yeah. elements, and it is still a beautiful, wonderful yeah. adaptation. Oh, yeah. Like it's it a was. fantastic adaptation, it was. and it's in very close third. Like we're not getting a lot of that interiority. It's all external yeah. and it's all visualized externally. Yeah, because and they so, want to make that Paul's story. They want to make Dune Paul's story, that's true. essentially, right? So, and like you said, sorry, AP, yeah, there's still stylistic choices, yeah. So with, with adapting something like Gardens of the Moon, 
you can choose to look at it from an overview and go, what are the main sequences of events? So whose story is it that we are following? Is it the story of the bridge burners? Is it the story of Gano's parent? Is it the story of Lorne? So if season one is the story of Lorne, that gives you a through point for what you're going to anchor the season to. And then you go, okay, Lorne's story interacts with Ganos, so that, that's going to be interwoven with her story all the way through. Uh, and then we're going to have the Darugistan. So who are we picking out there? Okay, are we going to pick out Crocus? So Crocus is going to be, so you have Lorne and Crocus is your through line. So you start mixing up, you start the Darugistan section earlier than it appears in the book because, you know, you don't go there until quite little. You start it earlier during the whole build up at Peel and the occupation of Peel we're jumping backwards and forwards to Darugistan already because that's Crocus going out and being a thief. It doesn't matter that the Malazans are already on their way. So mm. that can all be set up and you could do those things or scrap that idea entirely and you go, okay, we're going to look at Gano's Paran as a through line. Sorry, as a through yeah, line. Sorry. And uh, again, pick someone from maybe Krupp. Well, yeah. no, you wouldn't want Krupp. That's too much no. screen time for Krupp. <laughs> He's good in small doses. <laughs> But again, you see how you can, if you want to pick up on character threads, you can either do it with single characters or you go, okay, the bridge burner thread. We're going to follow the bridge burners as one line. We're going to follow the Darugistan crew as one line. And we're going to follow Ganos as an outsider all the way through as well. There's our three interweaving lines. And that's how you move backwards and forwards through the narrative. There are so many different ways to do this. When people say something is unadaptable, what they, I, I think people generally mean is either they think the special effects needed, they can't imagine anyone paying for it. Or yeah. they, they think, well, in order to put that on the screen, that would be really hard to do. And you go, but there are ways of thinking about it in terms of what is actually being communicated, taking a step back and not being literal about it. And that's, it, it just allows you, I, there are very few texts of traditional narratives like this. And Gardens of the Moon, despite what we have said about it, is a very traditional narrative. That there are very few traditional narratives that are unadaptable. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. but, but it's funny that, you know, and also perhaps it's all about as well what, what the author would want to convey in terms of the adaptation and what, I mean, Angie, you're a big, you're a big, Game of Thrones fans, I'm sure, sure we all are. Think about season one of Game of Thrones. If you'd never read the book, you would think that season, that Game of Thrones is Ned Stark's story. He's the main character. He's the main guy. Yes, Jamie's important. Yes, Sans is important. Jon Snow is pretty prominent. Yes, you know, but but you would think that this is this is Ned Stark's story, and it's a murder mystery essentially with all the fantastical elements, and you know that the 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 others are looming, but you know, this is more about Ned solving, you know, who killed John Aaron and and then, you know, like what happens. But then when we lose Ned, you realize, oh, well, maybe it isn't, right? And, you know, yeah, and yeah. then this sex season two where someone like Tyrion becomes more prominent and then the Lannister, you know, internal politics, you know what I mean? So you could have season one as, you know, everything, you know, say, let's just say Tattersail is, is the main character you follow. Well, when say Dallas be like, oh, 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 maybe she's not the 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 the, the hero of the heroine of the story. So I, I think that that that's also Yeah, and I think that um even if it's adapted, the backlash would come from the readers, not from the non readers, because it's the same experience that I have with Wheel of Time. When I was uh, I started reading it when the show was announced that I read the first three books. And uh when the show came out, my husband, who is not a reader, uh, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And he was like waiting every week, you know, mm -hmm. for the show. And then I'm going to Discord and seeing people dissing <laughs> the show. So, and because they are, they had this expectation, they had their own stuff going on in their brain, what they wanted to see, what they didn't want to see. And so, yeah, I, I think even if it's made, I think the non-readers will love it too and more. <laughs> Except yeah. much more than the readers, I think. Well, then I, I have a rule that I break all the time, but I try not to read the book at least a year mm -hmm. before the movie. But at least, and really the goal is 
put some space between the two or the movie, whatever, the adaptation. Mm -hmm. And it's just so instead of it becoming, you know, reading or and consuming the next bit of, of media isn't just a critique, but it is like you, it becomes more of a, oh yeah, I remember that. that would, oh, that's cool. Like, <laughs> that's, that's interesting how they did that. I remember that. <laughs> and it's more fond uh, reminders of, <laughs> of things that you read and loved as opposed to uh well, I can't believe they completely forgot this part. But one of one of my commenters actually had pointed out on a on a video I had where I was discussing aspects of adaptation, and they said that um, they watch a lot of manga and they they read well, they read a lot of manga and they watch a lot of anime. And there are some manga adaptations that are basically they they just take the comic book and animate it. And mm -hmm. they were saying that they didn't enjoy that because they'd already read it. And just mm. seeing it on the screen, they went, no, but I've already read it. Whereas the ones that they loved the most was a, a manga that they had read that the person had taken it and then done something slightly different with it, that it, was, it wasn't identical. It was true to the essence of the narrative, but was telling its own story in its own way. So it was using the source material as a source to build a new narrative out of. And they find that far more fulfilling than the simple sort of uh, translation of the page to the screen, which, you know, if you honestly think about it, is the least creative form of adaptation. <laughs> um, but I can understand if you care passionately about something and you've spent all this time visualizing it in your mind, that when someone makes a film or a TV version of something, you go, it doesn't live up to what you created in your mind. And you go, well, it can't. Our mind has a limitless special effects budget that we, we can create all sorts of special effects. And not only that, our mind is incredibly inaccurate in how we visualize things, that uh, how we think of the characters, how we think of the situations. Think of the number of people who describe Moonspawn as a floating castle when it is literally described as a floating mountain, that it is a giant lump of rock that there's a doorway carved out of, that it, it's a big lump of rock. It's not a floating castle. Um, mm. And yet a lot of the artwork is of this beautiful, uh, very European looking castle floating in the sky. And that's, mm. people go, oh yeah, that's Moonspawn. You're like, it looks nothing like the description. The number of characters in mm -hmm. Gardens of the Moon who are not white. And yet, no, so many. This one. <laughs> right? And it is, it's a beautiful image. Oh, yeah. That's, that's not oh. what, that's not what Moonspawn looks like. <laughs> but I, I framed it because I, 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 at that time I was so much obsessed about uh, Malazan. So I like, I need this picture. I wanted it framed. <laughs> yeah. And it is like, it's beautiful and it's a wonderful interpretation. And that's why mm -hmm. it, when people get very, caught up in fidelity as the mark of adaptation. Um, I think it, it getting very close to a purity test. And we know as soon as you start applying purity tests to things that you're on a very slippery yeah. slope, that fidelity is not necessarily measured in uh, the surface level detail. Fidelity can be very much about the heart of a story that you can change. Uh, one of the good examples of this is Clueless the adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. And it is a fantastic adaptation of Emma because its heart and soul is what Austen was doing, but it has been located in 90s California Valley Girl yeah, yeah, yeah. experience mm -hmm. with Alicia Silverstone. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it is a wonderful adaptation. It's speaking to the heart of Austen's text, but it's not trying to recreate Austin's Emma on screen, it's an adaptation. It has adapted it. Um, I've, I've always been curious just about like, I mean, you hear of like, just authors that hate, you know, the end product, right, of the adaptation. And I'm going, as long as it's it's good, right? <laughs> Whatever definition you, just, you 
put to that. Uh, that's obviously very subjective, but as long as, long as it's, it's generally, and obviously maybe uh, if you don't like it, they don't, wouldn't consider it good. But like, I just, what comes to mind is Stephen King and The Shining, right? Or Christopher Priest and The Prestige. Uh, just did not like the adaptations, but I'm going, uh, it, but it, they, they still are generally known as, as excellent movies right and and mm -hmm. even though they don't they you know they did not do exactly clearly what the the author wanted uh they still did its own thing so anyway just wanting your perspective on that because i've always kind of like i get it and i get if you're the author going well, yeah you missed especially if they missed a big theme right yeah. <laughs> in the movie but but even like the the, the king or the, the the shining and king like that that is quite well known as as just you know, both as the top of, of both yeah. of their genres or their. I, and you go, right. Well, the book, The Shining is not the film, The Shining. They, they are two different things. Um, and they both tell an element of that story. But Kubrick was telling a different story based on the book by Stephen King. There's exactly. the number of times people have said, oh, if only it said something like inspired by or based on. And you go, have you ever looked at the credit? Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, based on J.R.R. Yeah. Tolkien. Like it is um, the Wheel of Time, based on the books by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. Like they, they put this stuff in the credits specifically to go, <laughs> this is not the same thing. Um, mm. But yeah, sometimes <laughs> authors and and creative artists get very upset. Like Alan Moore, I don't think has ever liked a single adaptation of anything he has ever done. Um, and that's fine because for him, and I certainly wouldn't want to be speaking for him, but I think I remember him basically uh, articulating the point that if he had wanted to do a film, he would have done a film, but he, the reason it's in that comic book form, in the order uh, it is sequenced mm -hmm. in, and using those images the way that it does and the dialogue that it does, that is the perfect form for that story. So any form of adaptation is not going to be true to his vision because his vision is the telling of the story as a comic book. And I can absolutely respect that. And when you look at Zack Snyder's Watchmen, which you know changed the ending and, and changed yeah. a couple of the thematic yeah. things and changed the tone of some of the stuff of it, on the surface level, it looks very, very similar to Alan Moore's Watchmen, but it feels very different. And that's because Snyder tells a completely different story with the same story beats, because the heart of that narrative is actually different to the heart of Moore's narrative. Um, I, and and I, I think, you know, and as an author, again, I go back to, to, to that discussion that, that on page that what sort of Friday night conversation on Steve's channel that that we're talking about adaptation with AP and I was like oh no 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 uh, you know I don't if they, if they butchered the essence of my book I, I it doesn't matter how much money they gave me I, I wouldn't do it. it I think as authors I, I think we have a hard time you know we you know these books are our babies like we birthed them right like you gave birth to something and you have the same attachments that you know a parent would have in that you know um, you have you know, a favorite you, and you have the one that you don't exactly hide in the back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and you, you know, although of course, you know, and, and we, 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 we want to believe that, you know, all our children, we love all the children equally and we, we love all their idiosyncrasies equally. And, 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 and really truly we do, but then internally we're, we're, we're thinking differently. Right. And, you know, and I think that's when it comes to this adaptation stuff that that's where, you know, I, I started, I think I started part of the conversation about eagles and me not me feeling, uh, you know, that, okay, well, I should understand everything because oh, I'm an author, right? You, 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 you start to get, you know, this, this, the, the, you know, you, you let your ego potentially get in the way that, hey, you know what, perhaps the adaptation of your book might bring out elements that, are better than what you wrote or that people might enjoy more that will really draw readers to read your book, even though it is somewhat different And that, you know, but, but I, I think it's that, unfortunately, we, we, we can let these things, I'm not speaking for all authors, I'm saying me personally, I can understand how 
if someone came and said, hey, we want to make an adaptation of, of, of the Dragon Kingdom saga, and this is what we're going to do with it, I'm like, oh, that's not what I intended. You know, I didn't write that, but... But here, and then they know, say, and then they say, and here's the check that we're giving you, and you go, yes, that is exactly what I <laughs> you work away, big lad. <laughs> so yeah, yes, I, it's I, actually I, the spaceships are meant to be there, and the, uh, yeah. the dinosaurs and the time travel. <laughs> and you must be an English teacher. You figured it all out. <laughs> <laughs> I I wanted to ask to um, Gardens of the Moon, right? The title itself, it seems pretty hopeful for a book of the fallen. Is that am I, am, is that is that meant yeah. to be? Am I reading too much into that? Just well, because that was that line in there about um, the the story about Absalara. About Absalara, yeah. exactly. Um, and it it is it, weird enough. It's something that uh, is a crossover point into. Uh, the novels of the Malazan Empire written by Ian C. Esselmont. There's an aspect of the Apsilara story in the Gardens of the Moon that uh, is directly connected to one of those books. And also it's it's a recurrent theme for part of Darugistan. But part of, part of remembering people, the Book of the Fallen, um, is, well, A, we mourn their loss, but also we celebrate their life. And you don't have loss without the positive bit that came before it. Um, and so I think there's a balance between this being a, a dark, tragic, uh, complicated, gritty world and the, the bad things that happen in it. But also those shining moments of friendship, of love, of heroism, of genuine feeling and emotion. That that's when people say that realism, oh, it needs to be gritty to make it realistic, and that a more cynical ending is more realistic. Not really, because sometimes good things happen in life as well. And realism is a, is actually more of a balance. And yes, this is a, a dark world. But the people in it have various moments where their light shines. And that is this movement of darkness to light. And it is all blended by various shadows. And these shadows change in intensity. And that's the Book of the Fallen that is recounting what this historical event is over these 10 books, that you are looking at this historical event and noting the people that fell along the way. But you don't just tick their names off a list. You celebrate who they were, the good and the bad. So I think that's part of what is being communicated in, in the title, in the front matter, in, in that uh, epigraph that is the frame narrative for the series. And, and do you think there's a reason it's the first book title too? I mean, anyway, just maybe I'm reading too much in. <laughs> well, it, the reason I think it's the first it's book title it's is named it. <laughs> well, if it had been House of Chains, you sort of go, well, that started a bit early. That's book four. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, book you know, it, it's uh, titles are weird in that you know some people you try to use titles to communicate an aspect of the book. Other people have titles that they go, this is just cool. <laughs> oh, I like this. This sounds really cool. Or this is edgy, and it's a way to to communicate what type of book it is. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, each of, the, each of the titles has a resonance within the text that they are in, but also generally has a resonance with some of the other books because thematically there's a lot of similarity that are thematic links running through everything. And so when you think of the, the Gardens of the Moon story uh, that they, they tell about Absalara, and about these beautiful, perfect flowers that are so rare. And you then start thinking about it in terms of metaphor for life and metaphor for love and, and these different aspects. And you can start applying it if you really want to, but it's not necessary. Um, but we've been going now for, for about two hours. So oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, wow. I'm not saying that we have to cut off, but what I've realized is, I haven't, I haven't really been taking a lot of questions from you of things that you wanted to discuss, things that you wanted to discuss, things that you wanted to know. 
Yeah, one question I have. So these things, uh, what what are they called? These epigraphs, or what is this? The epigraph poems. Yeah. So, uh, I I am quite dense when it comes to poetry. Like I just skip over them. Even when I was reading Lord of Rings, I just skipped over. <laughs> so. <laughs> I've been watching you and Philip Chase dissecting <laughs> poetry and you're trying to understand, take notes and all that, but still, I'm not yet there. So how, how, how relevant are these, you know, for us to, if I'm going to read it, I would like to know, like for me to read this and understand these, right? And how relevant it is to the story and the chapter. Right. So you can, you can read through the whole of Gardens of the Moon without reading the poems and you will still understand mm -hmm. everything that happens. Mm -hmm. The poems... Uh, a, a number of them. If you read the poem, read the chapter that the poem is in front of, then go back and reread the poem and you go, huh, funny how this poem ha is exploring a theme that's explored in the chapter or is bringing up an element that is explored in the chapter. There is mm -hmm. almost always a link between what is in the epigraph, uh, particularly if it's a poem, and what is explored in the chapter. So the chapter, if you're finding it difficult, to, uh, finding it difficult to decipher or understand poetry, because you know, not all of us spent hours in school being beaten over the head with poetry books until we learned how to do it. Um, Aha, that's how you learn poetry. Okay. No. You just sleep with the, po <laughs> the book of poetry under your pillow via osmosis. <laughs> the knowledge just goes into your brain. Um, but there are, there are very specific techniques for poetry, but if you're finding it difficult to decipher the poem and you want to understand the poem and there's no need mm. to understand the poem, but if you want to, reading the chapter and thinking about the chapter in terms of what are the themes, what are the abstract concepts, what is occurring in the chapter? Is it about loss? Uh, does someone die and people feel bad about it? You go, oh, well, that's about loss then have a look at that epigraph to go, is an element of loss being explored here? And it's very much moving into taking that surface level information, thinking about the subtext, creating an abstract concept that you're then applying uh, and seeing revealed in a different way in poetry. It's that kind of, of linking. Um, and I have so to say on reread, they mean a lot more. That's yes, for sure. yes, yeah. yes, they do. And, and, and AP explained it beautifully and quite simply. The, the, chapter, the chapter, I can't remember, was before they actually started or proceeding about the, the poetry was about the Jagat. And then you, mm. you're just trying to convey how big and bad the Jagat is and then the poetry. Same with the dragons. When the dragon, before the dragons show up, there's a poem about the dragons. So yeah, AP, AP explained that well. And for me, it did make it very impactful because I do love, mm. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a sucker, sucker for it. And um, it did it did set me up nicely for those chapters to say, okay, now mm. we're going to see something epic. But one of the way, I mean, I know, like people do get very, very caught up in it. You, you need to understand everything. And if you think, do you remember you used to get a DVD and you could watch the film? And then you went into the DVD extras yes. and they had yes. like a bonus, the, the deleted scenes and then like a bonus mm -hmm. audio track of the director yeah. talking about something. Mm -hmm. These were added extras. So you can read Gardens of the Moon and just read through chapter one to what is it? Chapter 27, 26. I can't remember. I'm bad with numbers. Um, but you can read through and you go, there you go. You've read it. And then if you go back and you reread it, you're going to get the little DVD extras. You're going to get those little things that were dropped in. If you read the poems, those are DVD extras that are going to enrich and add yeah. to yeah. the mm -hmm. experience. None of these things are necessary to understand what is happening. The, the text mm -hmm. does that. Um, <laughs> and it's like the, ex the, the discussion we had at the beginning about, you know, there, <laughs> there are things that are happening, you are dropped in, but you just got to, right. you keep going. <laughs> and again, if you, if we have patience and we find this with uh, a lot of films where, you know, it, you're watching a film and stuff happens and then later on they go, ah, 
and there's an explanation for it. You know, because it's only 45 minutes, we've managed to sit on our hands for 45 minutes. Oh, look, there's the explanation. But sometimes with books, because of how long it takes yeah. us to read, we go, I didn't find out about this for 300 pages. I had to wait for 300 pages. And it's, it's an element of pain. We've become very impatient. Uh, when it comes to, I want to know, meet my needs now. <laughs> so, right. So does that answer your, your question, Angie? Yes, absolutely. Because I believe that like, the, if the author had decided to put something in the book, in their final version, then it's there for a reason, right? So I feel very guilty when I skip over those parts. But you know, some of them I really understood, like some of the chapters and some of them I did not because... Maybe I didn't pay much, much attention to some of the details, but yeah, but I will look forward to all those in my reread. <laughs> and, and I will say some, there are some elements in the book, uh, in, mm -hmm. in all of the Malazan books, be it by Erickson or Esselmont, that are insider jokes between Erickson and Esselmont <laughs> that no one else knows, that it was oh. something that they are winding each other up about. And this is, sometimes oh, wow. we stumble on something and you go, I wonder what, this is very strange. This is, and I would be talking, you know, Steve and I go, oh, uh, you need to ask Cam about that. And you ask Cam, you go, oh no, you need to ask Steve about that. And I'm like, okay, so it's one of your in-jokes, just go away. And they'll never, they'll never <laughs> tell. Because they were, when they were writing these books, a lot of this was, they were writing the book to entertain the other person. That was their mm. intended audience. That was how they were writing. That's who they imagined they were wow. telling the story to. And because of that, I th that explains sometimes, I think, the very personal feeling to the narrative. Mm. Well, and that's some of your talks with, uh, with he who shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Philip Chase uh, about the poems and then Steve gets in and then is like oh that's it anyway I just kind of get that sense we, when you guys are analyzing the poetry and he's like yes <laughs> no, but not all the time but also there's plenty that he's like no I meant that <laughs> well it, one of the things that I, I love is um, when I when I talk to Erickson about a lot of this stuff and I'll say like this is how I read it this is what I got from it and Erickson will go that, that is not what I intended at all. <laughs> but that's actually really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, there, yeah. There, you got me. Yeah. And then yeah. other times he goes, no, you've, you've misread that because I've done that. I went, no, you, you haven't communicated that well enough. But what I, what I love about that discussion is that he has never once said, no, you must read it mm. this way. He has never yeah, insisted that <laughs> you must do this. He goes, well, if that's what you got out of it, that's what you got. It, you are the reader. I can try to explain what I intended with it, but if you didn't get what I intended, then I failed in communicating that to you. And he's very open about his process, his writing, what he wanted to do with it. And he loves writing. He loves interacting with the readership and talking and being involved in these things. The one thing that neither he nor Esselmont like is coming down definitively to say, no, it must be this. And they're both very wary about that because they want to respect a reader's position. And it's only when readers actively misread something that the, it is not supported by the text. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is actually a very weird thing that is very hard for us to understand because we value the, the individual reading experience so much. We forget that readers can misread things. The text is not infinitely flexible and the text mm -hmm. does not, contain infinite information. You can make a mistake, you can misread. And if you've misread something, then someone's saying, no, you've misread that. And say, well, that's my valid reader experience. And you go, your valid <laughs> reader experience has misread that, you dumbass. <laughs> um, how you feel about it is entirely, I can't gain say. But you know, if you've misread something, if you've made a mistake, yeah. Then mm -hmm. yeah, that can be pointed out, and that's not invalidating your experience. It's pointing out you made a mistake. We're all human. Well, at least I am, um, and I'm fallible. I make mistakes. And it's and not isn't. Oh, sorry. Isn't that part of? I mean, that's like. I mean, their background, the author's background, is in anthropology. I mean, that's what they have been doing their career of trying to decipher what <laughs> some someone else has said anciently or or whatever and this mm -hmm. is i mean that's what they have literally 
done with these ancient texts you know that are the basis of a lot of these epigraphs or, or whatever it may be and they that's and then that's what they're doing is interpret what here it is and that's when and pl you'll understand when a reader really understands and articulates what you were trying to do in a section you go yes yes, yes. That's, yes. it is such a brilliant feeling and so like you come on and we were if we were sitting talking about that particular thing you go yeah that's exactly it i love i love that you got that and that's not you insisting you must read it that way it's yeah. you celebrating that a reader understood what you were trying to do and then if a reader had a different interpretation and you go you know what that's not what i intended but that's really interesting yes. that's made me think about it in a new way you're not offended that no. they read it in a different way but if they read your work and went this is a celebration of uh, colonial oppression and this is so pro whatever anti yeah, yeah. you go no you you have completely yeah. misread exactly. this like Mm -hmm. I understand reader autonomy, but where are you getting that from? That is not in the text. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is that, we need to have that awareness. No, um, absolutely. absolutely. But any other Malazan questions? I, I, I don't have so much a question, just more of a comment that, um, you know, uh, like, you know, having Angie Price AP here, like, I just can't thank you enough for the, the feeling of, this, of support with something like this, because again, you can feel almost inadequate, especially as a writer. I say, I say again, when you're, when you're not, you feel like you're not grasping something and you want to grasp something, it's important to you. And, but having good friends that have these insights and can offer you know, these explanations, is completely invaluable. I think this whole thing originally sprung from just I, I, I think I'd post in my review of Garden of the Moon going, oh my God, help. And AP was kind enough to go, you know, Paul, if, you know, if you want to, you want to have a discussion sometime about it, we'll, we'll, we'll chat about it. And then that, that sprung, you know, knowing that people like, like Angie and Bryce also were, were very much into the series and have, would have a lot of great, great insights as well. Like it just turned into this thing. So but I, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for being willing to do that and, 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 and put up with me in that, in that, in that way and, and and i honestly i just want to say finally i honestly am hoping because i feel for me personally as a reader this has that potential you know like i said the jr tokens the Janie words the you know the, the bernard cornwalls all of my favorite fantasy series this has the potential to join those those ranks and but i want to give it a chance to see if it can and because i i can i can see from the first book that for me personally, again, this isn't, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone else. For me personally, I think it has, been, but I, I need, I guess, having people like you help me, um, you know, interpret some things can help with potentially making that one of these because I hope it will be. It might not be. And if it isn't, it isn't. That doesn't detract from the greatness of Erickson. That doesn't detract. That's just me, obviously. But, but I'm hoping we can, for me, it, it can get there. And, you know, PL, that is an excellent point that you can, you can read something. And again, like we talked about this, you can recognize, I can see that this is really well put together. I can see the techniques being used, but you know what? It's just not for me, not, not at this time, not me as I am now, not what I'm currently interested in. And it, it, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't work. And, you know, it's not your thing. That is not a bad thing. And it is never, it's never anything to be ashamed of. And I always get... I get a bit annoyed at these people. Go, oh, this is a controversial series. You go, no, it's not controversial. There's nothing controversial about it. Oh, it's divisive. <laughs> some people love it. Some people hate it. You go, oh, so it's like a series of books, like any series of books that some people <laughs> like and some. You are astounding me with your insight. Insight. <laughs> are you telling me that you wouldn't recommend this to everyone? Oh, my God. Seriously, there are some people out there that you would not recommend a, a military mm. fantasy dark book that's written in a postmodern deconstructionist style. <gasps> Say it isn't. <laughs> no. Wow. You are, you are just blinding me with your insight. And this is the sort of thing that, that happens in these videos where people build up an expectation about this series that is completely and utterly unfounded. Oh, this mm. is divisive. You're like, it's not divisive in any way different 
to any other book. This is complicated. Well, it's only complicated if you're unfamiliar with the technique with which it has been written. Just as if you'd never read any book before and someone gave you the Stormlight Archives, book one, you'd go, oh my God, like what is going on? There's all this weird stuff and mm -hmm. there's different character mm -hmm. points of view because you'd never read fantasy and you'd never read multiple POVs. But as soon as you've read a bunch of books that have fantasy language or fantasy POVs, you pick up Stormlight Archive and it's a breeze. If you've read a whole load of books that are written in the style of Gardens of the Moon with that short story eye and, that, and those techniques, then you pick up Gardens of the Moon and it's not complicated. Oh, but it's so difficult. You're like, no, it's not. It starts in media res. So do half the films you watch. So do half the TV shows you watch. So do half the books you read. They start in media res. It's not, the fact that there is a term for it from the Latin should suggest to you that this is not a new or complex thing. It's yeah. been around since the Romans. Yeah. And yeah. people build up all of this. Extra. Oh, everyone, anytime I ask for a recommendation, everyone always says Malazit. Anytime you ask for a fantasy recommendation, you always see Sanderson. You always mm -hmm. see, you will always see the popular books that people are yeah. talking about. Yeah. Because if you go, can you recommend some fantasy? Oh, but. They, they, uh, I specifically was asking that had this thing. You go, well, Malazan has that. Mm -hmm. Malazan is, is a very amorphous, multifaceted series that contains a lot of different things. So if someone asks a bland, generic question, of course Malazan can fit the answer. Just as people who are fans of Sanderson will say Stormlight Archives or Mistborn for every time that you ask for a fantasy recommendation. So people don't think we have this very weird notion that we're... Uh, exceptionalizing certain things and we're not that the Malazan Book of the Fallen as much as I love it as much as for when it was written it was doing something in the mainstream of the genre that had not been done as actively and as uh, in the same form because you had like we have books by China Mieville that actively attack and in conversation with an argument with the construction of epic fantasy in the quest we have books by M. John Harrison uh, in the new weird that is exploring fantasy in a different way. You have all magic realism at uh, folklore, yeah. fairy tale. We have yeah. all of these different things. And people go, oh, but Malazin. And you're like, no. <laughs> I love this series. I think the series is fascinating. I think it's incredibly mm -hmm. well written. Does that mean it's perfect? No. No book is ever perfect. No book. No book. No. Nothing. No, it, no piece of art is ever perfect. No piece of art is for everyone. No piece of art is going to be universally admired. Some people are just not going to like it. And that is absolutely fine. But like tr talking about things honestly and thinking about what we say about them, because I am convinced people build up the complexity and difficulty of this series to such an extent that it is far overblown. That mm -hmm they make it out to be this undecipherable series that you have to read multiple times, which is clearly untrue. And they make a lot of judgments about, oh, it you constantly uses Deus Ex Machina, and that's bad. Yeah. Every, every, yeah. <laughs> Recognize the fact that this narrative term is in Latin and therefore has existed for a long time. Long time. Lord of the Rings uses Deus Ex Machina. Every, Every fancy book I get pick up uses. Well, and, and you're always going to have fandom, like parts of the mm -hmm. fandom. Like, I mean, I think it's well recognized. Like the Rick and Morty fandom has this kind of toxic edge to mm -hmm. it, right? That are they thumb mm -hmm. their nose at? Oh, we're we're highbrow. We like highbrow comedy here. Uh, and and you know, obviously, there's gonna be factions like that in in the Malazan world. Uh, because people like that's the very human trait that probably is uh, exemplified in the books themselves too. Yeah. Well, too. Yeah. <laughs> On a yeah. more general point, um, <laughs> epic fantasy, military fantasy, and the genre of fantasy in general, the fandom of fantasy has contained within it for for as long as like, since Lord of the Rings, at least, there has always been an element of that fandom, um, which. Mm -hmm was white supremacist, uh, racist, 
homophobic and sexist. That has been there since Tolkien's day. And to recognize that is not saying that every single fan of fantasy is like that, but that is an element of the fandom of fantasy, this small element. And we have seen with the Wheel of Time adaptation or the Sandman adaptation or the Rings of Power uh, adaptation, that there are elements of those specific fandoms who are yeah. racist and homophobic and sexist and misogynist. And some of them are, you know, really, really unpleasant and toxic. But that's not the entirety of the fandom. And also, it's not, not everyone who has a criticism is that. But there are a number of those people. And for everyone to go, oh, toxic fandom doesn't really exist. You go, yes, it does. Actors are getting death threats. Show writers are getting death threats and abuse yeah. and all of it. You go, it exists. And if you can't mm -hmm. see it, then maybe you're not opening your eyes to what is being experienced by creatives and other people. Because, yeah. you know, someone saying, oh, I love the, fan, the Sandman adaptation. How dare you call yourself a true fan? You, you, because you like that and they changed that thing and you're not a real fan. Yeah. But Neil Gaiman, the author, is not the one gatekeeping about who a fan is and who isn't a fan. Neil Gaiman mm -hmm. is saying, read the comics, listen to the audiobook, watch the TV show. Like, I want as many people to love this story as much as I loved it uh, when I created it. And Neil Gaiman is welcoming of all fans. And the people who are gatekeeping, the people who are deciding who a real fan is and who isn't, that's not anyone associated with the creation of these things. That's in the fandom. And it's not the whole fandom. It's the small element of the fandom every single time that tars the entirety of anyone who says that they like that book or that narrative. It's the, the few bad apples spoiling the barrel. There is a small element in almost every single fandom yeah, that but I think um, with uh, with Malazan, I think with the source material itself, I think it's very, um, it, it's not monolithic, right? It's not Eurocentric. You, you see different races, you know, from book one itself. And then obviously uh, there is a strong female characters and female characters are just there, just like any other male characters. Like, you know, they are in powerful positions. Nobody is questioning their, you know, the Empress position is, of power. Is... Right, yeah. agent and empress agent, and all these yeah. people. Yeah, and nobody is talking about gender as such. They're just people, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think if, if you compare to other fantasies which were written much earlier, like Lord of the Wings, this is much more progressive. I don't know if it was done consciously, but I think the source material itself is so diverse <laughs> that that gatekeeping elements, it, they might not be that strong, right? Because... Yeah. Yes, and now we have, care of it. yeah, and we have books now. Like my book, point out, yeah. you know, elements mm -hmm. of racism, homophobia, colonialism, sexism, on purpose to show, to depict, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what some of the societal ills are, and also um, to show what that looks like. Pull the curtain back a bit, and perhaps give that rationale of the other side. Why? Why would someone think like that? Why would, are they just evil? Are they misguided? Were they raised a certain way? Were, and, and that's what my main character is, right? But, but I try to make him realistic in that, you know, uh, many of our, our, our lionized heroes throughout the ages, that's what they were too, depending on the culture and, and the context. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I think what Malala, I agree with, with, with Angie, what, what Malazan does really well is, it, it, you know, and again, I feel that with these things, you can do one of two things. You can pre present the society where these things don't exist and show where we should be or where we, where we should be going or, or, and show the best of what we are or show the, the other side, right? The, the worst mm -hmm. and perhaps where we wish we weren't. So what Mal Malazan does well is I think it actually does, uh, as Angie said, excuse me, show, you know, those, those, you know, uh, where, where hopefully, you know, we will be. Uh, in terms of acceptance and tolerance and just just an organic like it is right um right. but one of the yeah, I, one I, of the I, interesting things uh, oh sorry angie please uh no i was just i don't know if this is connected but um there was this one video from andy smith uh where he talks about the post 
postmodern uh, theme uh, in uh, Malazan as opposed to a lot of the rings, which is uh, more modernist. I, 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 I'm not that. Uh, have you seen that video? It's an amazing, excellent video. So that's when I, uh, you know, started to try to understand these kind of themes in Malazan when I was reading through. Just wanted to point it out. Point it out. If PL has not watched it, please uh, <laughs> just I check will. it out. I will. Yeah. I will. Um, right. But one of the interesting things, obviously, when when Ericsson and Esselmont and their friends were gaming in the world, they wanted the ability to, you know, have male characters and female characters as player characters. And as soon as you have that, you go, well, I don't want the other characters constantly looking at my female character and go, well, it, you have to go and cook us all dinner. <laughs> and, and so it was the, the mere aspect of playing a female character in the world, they went, well, well, we have to make the default reality egalitarian in terms of gender. That the, the default is you don't distinguish in a power dynamic in terms of gender. That gender is not a bar uh, and thought of that way. And one of the, the rationales to, to work through why the, the world ended up without the same gender dynamic that we had was magic and magical healing uh, led to an extended lifespan for uh, people who could afford it. So you had an extended lifespan, mm -hmm. fewer, uh, fewer fa uh, fatalities during birth, fewer infant or a lower infant mortality rate, and therefore women had fewer children, could space out when they wanted to have children. And because they lived longer, they were fertile for longer. So there was a bigger window for this to happen in. And as a result, there wasn't what we had say, like uh, during the uh, early middle ages, they, where you had huge infant mortality. So women were you know, at home constantly having babies so that you could have a couple of them grow up. That that society never evolved because if, there's a wax witch who lives down the road can, you know, make sure that you get a wee bit of healing and it makes the pregnancy go better and it stops people dying off at an early age. Then you have a lower birth rate. It's spread out of, over a different time period. And that's how they rationalized it. Whether or not that works all the way through as a concrete way to shape the world, um, you know, is, is almost irrelevant. But that was how they rationalized it in their head. Mm -hmm. And it was a way to create a reason for why when they had the female characters, that the female characters were treated just the same as the male characters and could, could be assassins or mages or, mm. and wouldn't suddenly be talked down to by other people. And then what they did was, that was the default reality for the Malazan Empire. And then they went, right, well, not every culture in the world is going to follow that system. Yeah. And that allows you to explore then different attitudes because, and it's something that PL hasn't come up with, uh, come into yet, because you haven't read this. So it's not a spoiler, um, but I'm just going to say in Lethary, again, completely egalitarian in terms of gender, because that's not the, th that is deciding whether you're a high class citizen or a low class citizen. But gender, gender is not the divide. It's the other thing. And we see that uh, in different societies where they go, yes, that is the woman's role, that is the men's role, but it's not in terms of the power dynamic about who's allowed to rule, it's the division of labor. And it's, uh, we see that in some of the tribal societies that are depicted. But none of this is depict, or none of this is suggested that this is a good thing, this is a bad thing. It's presented again in that anthropological fashion of this is how the society is. And it's up to the reader to compare and contrast, to look at it in conjunction with other societies and cultures within the novels, but also within our own society. And that is something that I think is interesting in this series, particularly when, even within the, the, the fandom, a number of the fan castings for adaptations, some of the casting decisions, you go, they're awfully white for that character. And, and it's interesting how our internal thoughts and image of certain characters might be radically different from the physical descriptions of the character in the text. Or mm -hmm. if they don't have, and it's something that Erickson was quite deliberate about, a lot of them don't have physical characteristics detailed specifically for the character. But you find out where they're from. You, there's another mm -hmm. character from that region that's described. And you go, oh, that's what that character is going to look like. And so there's a lot of playfulness with that because it's mm -hmm. about reducing the importance of division according to skin color. 
and looking at it in terms of culture, which is an artificial distinction that we make, that this is from this tribe and this is from this clan. And you go, well, genetically, they're basically the same, but they're from radically different cultures because it's different societies. It's different ways of organizing people and our principles and, and what we believe are our uh, good, bad morals, what we think is standard behavior, what our default norms are. A lot of that and looking and asking questions about that, looking at that point and asking questions about it. This, this has been just phenomenal. I've just so, so enjoyed this. Right. This, this well, Bryce, do you, do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. I actually got to get out of off here pretty soon here, but I, I seriously, I've been doing the same. I've been all smiles the whole time. This has been yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> just so much fun. Um, you know, and I just thinking just from what you're just saying, though, like even it talks about in Gardens of the Moon, the Morant of you, you got to talk to the right color because they're, they're all at each other and you learn, you know, the bar guests are also have some own of their own, you know, it's not just a, you know, it, it just, it's all like, anyway it's just it's a real world right like that's why mm -hmm. i love it so much because it's such a real world <laughs> I mean, it, it feels and, it has all of the the conflict and yeah. contrast and and even contradiction that yes. we we expect in a real world because when we narrativize things we generally smooth things like we simplify things when we narrativize them and you know it's like we we begin at the very beginning when we were talking about this like in um star wars the empire are the bad guys all the stormtroopers look yeah. the same and all the empire they're all basically the same and the empire's evil and then you have the scrappy heroes and it's smoothed out that you get this like the empire is just one monolith and it's as we've seen with the, the different star wars iterations mm -hmm. and the the novels and the comics and the different computer games the empire is actually much more complicated but what we saw in that film was something that was just monolithic, very simplified. And we get used to that. Think of all of the Star Trek episodes. They beam down to the planet and the entire planet is based on Greece, ancient Greece. Yes. The entire planet is based on ancient Rome. The entire planet yes. is 1930s gangster. The yes. entire planet, and it's one monoculture across the whole planet because it's, that's what we have this week. And then when we arrive in a world like this where you go, yeah, even within the Malazan Empire, there are different factions. And within those factions, there are more factions. And that's as soon as you get inside a culture, you realize that it is not monolithic. And it's the same, we talk about fandoms, the Lord of the Rings fandom, but you go, it isn't the Lord of the Rings fandom, it's Lord of the Rings fandoms. Because yeah. as soon as you're inside it, you go, oh no, but I'm part of this aspect of Lord of the Rings fandom, yeah. not that aspect. And then when you're the in that kingdom, one, you're like, oh. phylum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and everything like that. Oh, that person's a Canadian. Oh, I know all about Canadians. Oh no, but they're <laughs> they're they're a new fee rather than coming from BC. And you're like, oh well, that's different. You know, there are all of these different ways of breaking down identity, and they're all so. It eventually gets down to basically you're the only person in the group because it gets down to your unique identity, and that's what it's all about. That movement up and down between very generalized broad statements and the very narrow interpretation. And we have, to, we have to accept that movement. And sometimes that movement produces contradictions. That's fantastic. Well, I, and I know Bryce has to go, probably people have to run. Uh, we could probably talk about this all day. Um, but I just want to say <laughs> as well that, that, that Erickson uh, led me directly to another great Canadian author. I'm Canadian, proud Canadian, and I'm proud to, to see uh, this written by, by a phenomenal Canadian author. It led me to uh, our Scott Backer. I'm not sure his name mm -hmm. or back or how it's pronounced, but that led me to his Prince of Lisi, which I which I am loving, which I started for first book. Love it. So I feel there is a value in reading books like this, who outwardly appear very, or by reputation appear very complex, very convoluted, very hard to understand. However, if you give it a chance, and that goes with literature in general. And as AP said, it may not be your taste, it may be, but if you give it a chance, and especially if you're willing to finish the chapter, finish the book, go to book two, you might find that, you know, down the road, it becomes something you really enjoy. So, you know, again, thanks to AP and Bryce and, and, and Angie, I plan to give this series a chance and the first book, and now I'll be on to the second book, you know, hopefully this year. And, yeah. and uh, 
uh, hopefully I continue to have friends like you along the way to help me, help me through it. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining me. I, like, I appreciate this has been a, a long chat and I <laughs> yeah. apologize that we, I, I feel that we didn't answer the things that you wanted to talk about the book. We were, we were talking about, we had a really fun conversation, at least from my point of view. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining me. And for those of you still watching, thank you for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I will link to uh, the various YouTube channels uh, for my esteemed guests. And we will see you in the next one.